you're back with Shrek aboard the Noob Sparrow podcast to head out and interview another bunch of legend Sparrows from around the planet. Today, it's the UK. Richard, Ben and Anthony from the Sparrow Hangout podcast. Jump on with me and uh, these fellas, they're proper entertaining. Um, check out the Spiro Hangout on Instagram. Check them out on Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts. Very, very cool dudes. Um, this is kind of a quick summary on what the boys said. They said, we're super passionate about sustainability and growing spearfishing in the UK. All three of us have just been voted into the British Spearfishing Association. We're all about trying to implement new ideas and changes to help the sport grow and make sure it's represented in a good light. It's a relatively new mainstream sport in the UK and we have a unique position where we can make a big impact. Hence the reason we started the Spiro Hangout podcast. Alongside this, there are some epic British made comp- British spear gun mate or spear fishing equipment companies rising up. We're super keen to work alongside these companies to produce some cool gear. Um, says, although the UK is surrounded by water, as a nation, our sea awareness is terrible. We've been tasked with the job of lobbying to try and create awareness around spearfishing and spearos and alpha flags to create a safer environment for all water users. Um, So it's pretty cool. Um, But these guys are entertaining as well. Um, That's kind of the the cliff notes, what they're about. But I tell you what, Anthony, Ben and Rich are just really top blokes, very funny And uh, we have a blast in this chat. Um, Before we get there, as usual, a couple of shout-outs. I just got back from my Stradbroke uh, weekend spearfishing and freediving course. It was the very first one. I ran it with Kieran Limpus, our students, uh, our crew for the weekend, if you like. These these guys were cool. We had Jeff, Alex, Jaden, Linton, David, Rex, Scott, and Luke. And we had an absolute blast and learned a hell of a lot. We had some dreamy conditions um up to 15 meters visibility at one point um but also down to sort of three meters vis- and and so we, we had some variation in there but um the the top side conditions were magic um there were fish about the boys got to learn a whole bunch of skills and safety and become pretty effective with uh with a whole bunch of it and karen and i of course it was our first course so we were learning sort of on the go and these guys were very much our crash test dummies but they were so graceful and helpful they looked after each other and we cooked up some awesome feeds we shot some good fish and uh we we had just had fun and i think that's what these courses are going to be about so if you are interested in, uh, in doing one in the brisbane area or even further north in queensland i'm i'm definitely looking at doing that i know a few people have said, hey, come over to my area of the world and do a collab course. I'm um, very much interested in that, and uh, that's kind of where we're going to be heading. But um, if you're interested in that, email me, shrek at noobsparrow.com, and I'll chuck you on the list, and I'll send you out a video, pretty much, of the first course. Um, in other news, guys, head up to noobs, into noobsparrow.com and leave me a voice message for the podcast. If you've had a scary situation where you learn something, if you've got a new bit of gear that you're just frothing over and you think it's a game changer leave me a voice message if you you know you have some feedback or some ideas or you want to get involved in the conversations that have happened on the podcast leave me a voice message i'll try and include it in an upcoming episode and uh, i love getting that engagement and um, it's very much what guys are doing on the noob sparrow community on facebook and punching out on instagram as well follow noob sparrow there and uh yeah awesome i love this community we're doing we're doing awesome things. It gets better every year and um, got such a, a great mix of people in there. Like-minded legends just sort of um, becoming part of the conversation. The 2023 Freshwater World Spearfishing Tournament is being hosted by the NFSA. It'll be held in Lake Powell in Page, Arizona from May 16th to 20th. Spearos and legends from all over the world are travelling to compete in the largest freshwater spearfishing tournament in one of the largest man-made lakes in the US. Event details are at freshwaterworlds.com. Come and join us at Lake Powell in 2023. Very cool comp. Jerry. Guerra from Neptonics. Him and I have been chatting a wee bit. We're talking about what we're going to get up to in 2023. This guy, uh, I had to give him some good feedback. He's just been working his butt off. I don't know if you guys have bought gear from Neptonics, but their email service and their feedback and their their follow up is just is just fantastic. Like um, I I haven't found 
service like it, particularly with um, you know just chasing up an online order. I ordered something um, in Australia from the US, and uh, I know the shipping rates are fairly prohibitive. But if you're a US-based bureau, I reckon it's a it's a no-brainer. Go to Neptonics.com, use the code Noob10 to save 10% off. Um, your order um, but we've got some cool things coming up in uh, this new year as well it's great to be partnered with legend companies like that uh, noobspero.com 99 spero recipes continues to fly out of there um, as it does from every legend spearfishing retailer that is shopping it james o says 99 spero recipes is a fantastic book i brought one for myself and one for a mate and he gave us five stars thanks mate uh, awesome review i can always always read good reviews let's get into today's interview the spiro hangout boys uk spearfishing and some great great accents let's do it I can't wait to get into today's episode, brought to you with proud partner, adreno.com.au. The Noob Spiro podcast has been partnering with adreno.com.au for more than 100 episodes, and these guys are awesome. They have uh, huge spearfishing mega stores all over the country. You can shop online or in store. Use the code Noob Spiro whenever you spend more than $200, and you will automatically save $20. That's right. Use the code Noob Spiro online or in store when you spend more than $200 and save 20 bucks. I love these guys. I remember the first time I brought a spear gun at adreno.com.au down at the Wool and Gabba store. And Adreno have been a huge part of the excitement that I have about spearfishing. Check them out at adreno.com.au. Use the code Noob Spiro to save. Neptonics was founded in 1996, making trigger mechs in a barn in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Solid Gear That Works was their founding principle and it still rings true today in every pull of a Neptonics trigger, in every snap of a Neptonics band and in every whiz of a Neptonics spear gun reel singing with the power of another big fish. Got a great deal, you can use the code NOOB10 to save 10% off anything and everything at Neptonics.com. It's Solid Gear That Works, equipment you can rely on. Save 10% off any order at Neptonics.com when you use the code NOOB10. When you're starting to spearfish, there are a number of obstacles, and some of them are financial. Doing a freediving course is something that I've always recommended on this podcast. If you can do a freediving course with a Spiro, even better. But some of us can't even afford that. I've got good news for you. Today, you can do a freediving safety course for free at noobspiro.com forward slash Ted. This course is brought to you by Ted Hardy from Immersion Freediving. He's got a passion for helping Spiros to die safer, smarter, and have more fun as well. This freediving safety course is practical and it's free. Check it out at freedivingsafety.com or go to noobspiro.com forward slash Ted and you'll find it there as well. Again, it's a free course just teaching you the basics of freedive spearfishing safety. Check it out, noobspiro.com forward slash Ted. All right, guys, uh, welcome to the News Show Podcast. I'm joined by three absolute characters today. It's the the co-hosts, the hosts of the Spiro Hangout Podcast. Out of the UK, they're a cast of shapes. We've got a triangle, a circle, and a square. Ben Dunford, Richard Gomez, and Anthony Fraser. Welcome, fellas. Hey, buddy. Evening. Nice to see you. That was my best BBC. Thanks for the invite. That was my best was BBC great. voice. Sorry about that. No, it was perfect. Oh, it's you guys do accents? Crock. Yeah, crikey, mate. That was brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, I don't know how bad that was. <laughs> what about you, Anthony? Anthony's you normally the one that bangs out all the accents. Who oh, does? Well, if, you, if you want my Australian accent, yeah. it's cunt, cunt, cunty, cunt, cunt, cunt. <laughs> That's about it, really. Isn't it? <laughs> well, way to start off a PG podcast. Thanks for that, Anthony. No. <laughs> it's no. fine. We've uh, we've got one of the beatboxes, um, so just beat me out. Oh, wow. Will Will you actually feature in the interview if we use that, though? Yeah, 100%. <laughs> Every second or third word. Uh, no, yeah. Awesome. Um, so you guys have been going since – did you start the podcast last year? Yeah, yeah we only like started a long time the, ago. Uh, yeah, the end, well, beginning of July we started last year. All right, and you pumped so, out like uh, 20-something episodes already. Yeah, we're, we're on episode 22 now, so. Nice job. Yeah, we've been trying to do them on, on the regular, but um, as you know, as you very well know, it's it's not the easiest thing, is it? So oh. we, try, we try our best anyway. Let's a, put it that way. <laughs> a, a bit of behind the scenes here. Like I tend to organise an interview day when I have like an RDO from work or something, and I'll just batch out like five or six in a day if I can. And then. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, but you guys have had some absolute. Legends on your podcast. I'm listening to. I'm looking forward to listening to the recent two. You had 
Joe PK, who I've been meaning to get on for a while. What's he like? He's brilliant. Is yeah, he exactly I like he is on the YouTube channel? Yeah, we always listen to the podcast like ourselves, like in the car or like going for a walk or whatever in the following week because you can never like soak everything up in the interview. Mm. And that's why we started this podcast. It's all about us basically being selfish and grabbing as much information from the community as possible. And um, yeah, he's just pretty, such a knowledgeable guy. He's been doing it for 10 years and um, he just... He just knows so much over that time. You, you pick up a hell of an amount of information and um, mm. he just, like you, you would say, Shrek, he, he frosts on it and he, uh, he absolutely <laughs> loves it. He's a frother. <laughs> the uh, Joe BK podcast, I listened to it because I wasn't present. I was uh, working oh. while they were recording, but uh, it was, it, Joe is a really, really down to earth, really nice bloke, but also mm. the dirtiest devil. <laughs> and uh, I'll, I'll I'll let Joe <laughs> explain some of that, but uh, yeah, D- Daniel Mann also during the podcast or after the recording um, gave us a few tidbits about Joe. So yeah, we, wow. we're getting to know him more and more. <laughs> the real Joe, far out. So we we might have to tune into Spirit Hangout just to listen to that and get some dirt on Joe. That's bloody good. Um, so you guys are all pretty heavy into the club scene over there in the uk it seems like a mad rush like it's a huge growing sport there and it seems kind of bizarre to some other people that are looking in because the water is often accused of being freezing or frigid at best and then it's always filthier it seems so but i know that's not actually true you guys have got some pretty cool spearing conditions over there but i'd love to hear how all of you kind of got into it and and um why you've Headed into the club route while you started a podcast. Should we yeah, well, start? I guess, um, oh, yeah. Richard, you might want to go first because you, you you started first, didn't you? And you, it was also your idea for the podcast. Yeah, no worries. Uh, yeah, so I've been spraying for well, about five years or so. Um, and essentially, like, I went, I approached Ben last year and I just said to him, listen, like, I've got this idea for a podcast and thanks to you, Shrek, actually, for that inspiration because you're the one who kicked it off for us. And I remember messaging you at the time saying, like, you're not going to get offended if we start one over this side, are you? I don't know if you remember that or not. No, nah, no, um, I don't even remember. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> no, really? And yeah, well, at the time you probably thought, oh, who the hell is this? <laughs> Nah. But yeah, like I remember a message you saying, like, listen, you're right if we just stop um, our own little podcast over in the UK because I feel personally that the UK has its own little sort of um, scene when it comes to diving compared to the rest of the world. Mm. Um, sometimes we got like some really just crappy conditions, um, which we, you know, we're quite resilient against, and then other times we have got amazing conditions. I mean, it's just so like yeah, it's it's very um, swings around about really for us. And it's 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 something we adapt to quite easily. But I said to the lads, I was like, listen, let's let's get together, let's do a podcast. I said to Ben, because Ben's actually the technical brains behind everything. Mm. And I said, I approached him and said, listen, what can we do? Let's get something together. And at the time we didn't have Anthony with us. And we weren't a third member. And like whenever I explain Anthony to anyone, I can't just explain him as, you know, that fat bearded guy from the ha- uh, hangover movie. Uh, that's <laughs> Anthony, basically. Um uh, we we needed that sort of element to the podcast, and me and Ben said, All "Right, let, let's ask Anthony if he'll jump in and get involved." And yeah, ever since then, us three have just been going for it. Um, you know, our podcast, we just we wanted to just be ourselves. We don't want it restricted in any way, shape, or form. Um, you know, like if you don't want to hear swearing stuff like that, then don't come over. Um, but that's just who we are. We just want to talk to people. We just want to be ourselves, and we just wanted to really find out how everyone's doing everything, how they are, you know, different parts of the country in the UK, you have to hunt in different styles, basically. Mm -hmm. And we just wanted to get the load down on that and find out what was going on. Um, But yeah, I mean, the the club scene, you know, this year we've taken a much bigger um, role in the club. So Anthony, as he's the new chairman, so I'll let him go into that. But um, I'm the new social media manager, thanks to Anthony. I wasn't actually going to be, but he put my hand up for me. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and um, yeah, so, yeah, it's it's great, though. I mean, like, you know, we've been involved in the club this year a little bit. Uh, sorry, last year a little bit. And it's been fantastic. I mean, the amount of people that we've met, you know, there's some guys in the club who've been spurring for, like, 40-odd years, and the amount of information you get off them is unreal. Mm. It's just um, it's fantastic. But yeah, next year we're going, well, this year, sorry, we're going to be going, I keep 
getting 2022 and 2023 mixed up. <laughs> um, we're uh, we're going to be getting involved a lot more in the club this year, you know, because obviously now Anthony's chairman, I'm social media manager, and I'm actually on the committee for the Dorset BSA, which is um, my local club. Okay. And uh, and yeah, so it's it's something that we're really going to try and push sustainability and other bits and pieces. But I'll let Anthony go into that in a minute. Um, but yeah, that's our style for me anyway. Well done on just being able to have turns at talking. It's so easy, like when you're in a group podcast, to talk over each other, <laughs> and it's hard because you're talking about something that you know everyone's excited about, and so it's, so it's it's pretty cool. I think you guys have got a really good balance. So Anthony, like from what um, Richard's told me, you've only been spearing about a year, but you came in ninth in a comp this year, and um, you started competing only recently as well. And he also says that you're the punching bag of the podcast. He says you love to be ripped a new one. These are the great facts to find out about you before I meet you. Yeah. So, I mean, first of all, I'm extremely complimented by the likeness of, I would say, comedic value of mm. Zach Galifianakis. <laughs> that guy is a legend. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't say, I, I would have said between, Richard Moore is. That between his two ferns is, is, is some of his better <laughs> stuff, I reckon. I love Zach. I've watched every oh, single yeah. episode and. I think my, my comedy value has always been from my upbringing. Um, my family's always had a bit of a a dark sense of humour and sort of a lightheartedness where really we don't get offended by much. Um, and we, we, I've just been brought up with ripping the living hell out of each other. <laughs> um, and normally I'd replace the hell word with something else. But uh, I, I'm now the BSA chairman, so I have to be careful with my language <laughs> at some point. But, um, yeah, no, I, I started spearfishing um, after seeing a what looked like member of the SAS mounting a, a small surfboard, getting into a local beach with a quite attractive blonde on a stand-up paddleboard following him and he had a spear gun in his hand i was with my other half and i was like what the hell is that guy doing i don't care what it is he looks fucking cool there's the language um i just want to get into it and so within a week i'd already been down to the spearfishing store in plymouth uh met barkley met joe pk um spent an obscene amount of money um and got everything i possibly could um Obviously started off with the plastic fins, but went for the full suit and everything. And uh, went out like the following day, lost the first spear because as I shot underwater in a 50 centimetres viz, the, the mono wasn't attached properly. No fault of Barclays, but uh, the spear then disappeared into the ether. Um, and really just fell in love with the feeling of <laughs> just the, the separation from life to being in the sea um, and just absolutely fell in love with that that feeling of yeah being in the water um, and then over that year met everybody immediately joined up to the BSA um, and at the time was the ex fishing club and I'm still a member of the ESC um, which is the local club with yeah as Richard was saying an extremely experienced group um, that have been spearfishing before the BSA was even a thing. Um, you know, spearfishing in the UK is, as Richard was saying, quite difficult because the viz conditions mm. are weather patterns. Um, but yeah, joined the ESC, fell in love with the sport. Um, and the last year was just amazing. Spent the whole of winter because I was still, as you would say, frothing um on the sport so i was in for you know eight hours there was one session i remember i went out spearing with ben and no 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 sorry no i went out spearing with dave o'callaghan on his boat went out for six hours and obviously we were still we still had a bit of light and after those six hours got in the car drove an hour to go and meet ben and went and had an evening session grabbing flatties oh, um beautiful and so it was the best part of 11 hours of the water, but just absolutely adore the sport. Um, last summer, got into the competitions, loved those as well. Again, like Richard says, um, now that we're part of the BSA, it's just trying to look at the sustainability aspect from the UK scene and trying to make sure that we're not necessarily appeasing everybody we can, but just looking at it from a common sense point of view. Um you know, like on the RAS front, I am an advocate 
Faras. I adore them. They're tasty. They're really, really good. But during a competition, um, do we need to shoot all the ras <laughs> in, you know, the, the two miles of sea that we're, we're, we're doing the sport in? Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, had a really, really good competition and then ended up having the AGM, which is the annual general meeting for the BSA. Um, Maxime Blondel, who was the chairman last year, stood down. The Frenchman. Was just, He's another episode. The of Frenchman. Yours. I listen to that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Absolutely, a phenomenally experienced Spiro. Um, it is now bringing in a new level of courses into the UK that he's going to obviously, you know, he's trying to push into the UK so that Spiros are more safe um, <clears throat> while they're out either solo diving or buddy diving, obviously, which we advocate. Um, but yeah, it was he, he did he did what he could last year. Um, and then this year it was a case of during that AGM, it went silent when they were voting for the chairman and I found myself putting my hand up and then putting Richard's hand up and then putting Ben's hand up. <laughs> I don't want to say I'm a bully, but... You're a puppeteer, um, sounds like. You've just got strings attached to the boy's arms and you're just like volunteering them for everything. Love it. Exactly, exactly. I, uh, before Richard even said it, I didn't realise that Rich and Ben had had conversations before the podcast, before I was involved. So I'm mm. even more honoured now to be involved. But, uh, uh, yeah, I've got to bring some form of humour to the podcast, otherwise everyone will go to sleep. Yeah, that's bloody good. <laughs> um, I want to come back to you in a sec, Anthony, and talk about, I think we should talk about the equipment hurdle, you know. Like, it's a significant barrier to entry for a lot of people. It is a good lump of capital that we throw in to get started spearfishing mm-hmm. we'll circle back to that in a sec i just want to hear a little bit more about ben so ben you you managed to finish fifth or something in your in your start point species comp how many people compete in this comp and how did you manage that well, i guess there's more 30 or 40 people compete and i think you know i, I don't think i'm an amazing spear i think it's probably just that i spent a lot of time in the water this year that's what it's all about right getting in as much as possible but i was quite dedicated to the cause of finding different fish so the idea with the species hunt is you need to get it's from a list of i don't know 20 different fish and um crustaceans and shellfish and you need to get three of each species and each one is worth a certain number of points so for example a dover sole really tasty fish quite rare i guess seven points each whereas a bass a bit more common and it was like two points each or something like that maybe mm. four um so yeah I, d- I just thought the idea was such a um really good introduction into where to find different species in the uk i think the spe- the uk's got a bit of a reputation for being quite um boring and then you know you've only got pollock and we've got bass and that's about it maybe some mullet but actually I shot, you know, my first year of spearfishing, was, was it 16 different species wow. in the end. So there's there's actually quite a lot of diversity in the UK if you know where to look. It's just that, you know, a lot of people are just out hunting bass and, and that's um, that's great. You know, if, if, if you like bass, brilliant. And, and, and that's what you enjoy. But for me, it was quite nice learning because it's all different techniques, right? So for a bass, you want to be, well, the way that I've found most of my bass is like in real shallow water, hunting amongst the string weed and kind of looking for shadows and trying to like, you know, just go really slowly um, and kind of sneak up on them. Whereas with flatfish, it's a bit different. You need different kind of conditions as well. You need really good biz to hunt for flatfish or if you're hunting for red mullet, different, um, you know, stages of the day. Like there's all sorts of di- kind of different factors that um, and different terrain, different kind of mm. things that lead you to different fish. And I, I, for me, that's that was just really exciting. I've always loved the sea. Like you know, I, I grew up by the sea, um, always going fishing with, with with my dad and and my brother and and my sister, and just um, being able to take all that knowledge and apply it to being under the sea, like with with the fish. I, it's just you know, it's taking everything to the next level for me. Your um, your 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 um enthusiasm for it all's like pretty obvious um i think you've you've got probably what i would tend to say an analytical mind as well so you you've yeah. found a way to really make the most of that in a really relaxing and calming environment um with the competing and competitive spearing in general i think sometimes it gets accused of taking us away from that enjoying just the the you know the the frothy aspect of spearfishing and getting us more into like a there's five points and three points and 
you know, and it's sort of distracting and it's like we're taking our world into this place that is supposed to be like. Yeah. Oh, yeah it might be true for some people, actually, Shrek. That probably yeah. is the case in, in some kind of worlds. But for me, certainly this year, maybe I'll take it more seriously in the future. I don't, I don't know. But for me, I shot five fish, count them fish, I don't know, um, on the first competition, only two of which were, you know, which counted because I shot, was it two cuttlefish? Um, a flounder that was a bit too small, still legal, but didn't didn't fit in, and a place another flounder. Um, so for me, it was about I'm I'm just going out spear fishing. Yeah, I'm going yeah. out with you know people that I like spending time with. Yeah, and um, like competitions, you learn so much. You get to kind of talk to people who you wouldn't normally talk to. Yeah. You get to soak up all the information around the gear, where people have gone, what kind of places they were fishing, what fish they're bringing back from those places as well. So like that first competition we saw some huge red mullet pulled out and, you know, I made it my mission that year to go and get a red mullet. And and I did, I got, got three red mullets. So it's just stuff like that, that, you know, it gets you really excited. So I'd say if you haven't done a competition, just give it a go. You might like it. You don't have to take it seriously. You know, it's not the Olympics, right? <laughs> I think you've found a nice way to make it work for you. Like it just, uh, it's, it's added to the experience for you rather than taken away from it. I, I like the fact that it, it does make you a better hunter too, because I think when, yeah. when you are hunting a variety of species over, as you said, like a whole different array of terrain and conditions, then it forces you to think and adapt and, and know what you're doing. That's for sure. Um, boys, we, we chatted before Anthony mentioned earlier about that huge, um amount of money you spent on your first lot of gear um richard you did it you started five years ago so d- what how did you did you just slowly acquire stuff or did you just jump in with all the all the wrong stuff or did you was it was all all the gear and no idea oh well um yeah i had no idea and hardly any gear to be honest um but yeah my, my brother actually is the one who got me into spear fishing because he became a uh a uh i think it's level four um qualified free diver so I sort of got into it from him and we we started off by going down to one of the shops and just buying some cheap like 70 semi uh, the cheapest brand you could get off the rack basically mm. and he's I, I make i you know always refer back to this joke on our podcast where i say you know my brother still shoots fish with that gun today and it's like the rustiest <laughs> dullest thing you could ever find you know <laughs> it still shoots fish and and the point is really is that you don't need to spend heaps on gear do you um, you know, I, I, one of um, our really good mates, David Callahan, who, who um, we referred to earlier. I mean, we we joke because, you know, we do joke around, but in fact, it's true. He has this spear gun, which is literally basically a broom handle, which he's adapted into a spear gun. And I don't know how long he's had it, but Anthony, I'm sure knows. But it only recently broke, and that's probably why he's got a new gun. I mean, it just it just goes to show you don't need all these fancy all the fancy gear. But um, yeah, I, I started off with a five mil surf wetsuit actually and um sort of in my third year when i started to get a bit more serious about spear fishing that's when i started getting you know bits and pieces and everything else and i must admit this year my last year that i was spear fishing with with these lads is that you know when i've started to really get serious about spear fishing mm. and started spending a lot more money on gear and everything else that goes with it so um now now i'm rolling with a um carbon gun and i've got the um you know my big as the lads like to say my big boat but it's uh you know it's it's a bit of a fancy float but it does the job <laughs> what have you and um what sort of boat did you buy you bought a rib was that you or anthony that I was oh no that, that that's anthony that's got the oh. rib so you know and look that's after one year i mean <laughs> we've all been there <laughs> I, yeah but I, 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 the other thing that you're forgetting to mention is the reason why you have the carbons and how many blowjobs you had to give to borrow the carbon <laughs> guns from <laughs> daniel newman hi dan i love you um and <laughs> the, the only thing that i would interject and put in is that uh the nicknames of a couple of the names that have been mentioned now is dave o'callahan is my sugar daddy um and is is kind of also the reason why i have it, it's kind of like the people that watch youtube and, and learn 80 percent, or the old adage of you know you can learn a skill to 80% really quickly um, or 90% really quickly, but then the last 10% takes a lifetime. Um, you know, I've been very fortunate to be with Davo and Rich has been very fortunate to leech off of Daniel Newman. But, <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, it's... Uh, That's a Pareto principle, eh? Like, 
you you twenty percent of the effort for eighty percent of the result, but then the rest of it, the rest of the uh, sort of the skills and expertise take a lifetime to acquire. Yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah, that is. You stand on the you stand on the shoulders of the people that have gone before you. I think YouTube has opened up a whole new world for us. Obviously, podcasts as well, and books, and there's online courses yeah. and all sorts of stuff. So for sure. I mean, these two boys owe me everything because I think I took both of them on their first dives, actually. <laughs> I might be wrong. Did I or not? No, not, not the first dive. First boat dive, to be fair, uh, though, mate. Yeah, uh, okay, fair little, enough. Little blow-up. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you didn't, you didn't take me on my first dive. However, I owe you for conquering my fear of the kelp. Oh, that... I thought I broke both your cherries, man. <laughs> no, no, no. Only the anal one. <laughs> yeah. uh, only the bedroom one. Um, (laughs) (laughs) I just love a functional and simple spear gun that I can trust when I pull the trigger. Killshot spear guns utilize the finest of kiln dried Burmese teak. Killshot spear guns also combine American made parts and fine craftsmanship to bring you accurate, reliable, and simple spear guns that you can trust fish after fish get $30 off any kill shot spear gun at killshotspearguns.com yes and amen uber that's $30 off american made performance spear guns at killshotspearguns.com i'm really sorry for this terrible accent brought to you by ed martin at killshotspearguns.com function first pretty design second Penetrator's dual action water channeling rail provides more efficient action and similar fins by directing more water flow down the blade. This eliminates wobble, meaning that you get way more bang for your buck, for your energy buck. Visit penetratorfins.com, use the code NoobSpiro to save $25 on every pair, on any pair. That's correct my friend, use the code NoobSpiro to save $25 on any set of Penetrator blades at penetrator.com. In the world of freedive spearfishing, there's no magic breathing technique that's all of a sudden going to get you down and shoot massive fish at depth and holding big bottom times. But there is a way to do it safer and smarter, take down more fuel to maximize the time that you have there. Learn at noobspearer.com forward slash Ted with Ted Hardy from Immersion Freediving. If you take down more fuel, you can stay for longer. Learning to take a bigger breath is not such a big deal. Ted breaks it down for you with a free online course at noobspiro.com forward slash Ted. Take down 20 to 30% more air just by learning how to take a full breath. Again, learn how to do it free at noobspiro.com forward slash Ted. Great news, guys. Adam Stern has made his freedivingfamily.com courses available at a discount for the Noob Spiro community. If you get on freedivingfamily.com, use the code Spiro, you'll get 20% off any course there's a bunch of sick courses on there there's an equalizing uh stage one there's an equalizing advanced techniques um video there they're two of my absolute favorites if you have any problems with equalizing go to freedivingfamily.com get adam's course and use the code spiro to get 20 percent off any course check it out at freedivingfamily.com I'm looking at some um, stuff on your Spiro Hangout Instagram here. Um, you boys look like you had a pretty good sort of back end of 2022. Yeah, it was amazing. It's, was it- it's all over now. We haven't been in the water yeah. for a, a few months, unfortunately. But, <laughs> I was going to say. La- like- last year was just epic. Yeah, I mean, we, we were out when we when we could get permission two, three times a week, almost every week. Okay. Uh, it, it was it was great. And, and um, you know, we don't just dive together. We've got a few other close friends that we dive with as well, but a lot of the time it was together, and it's always a real good laugh, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, Absolutely. that that competition that we were talking about, the uh, the species competition, that was a great laugh between us three last year, wasn't it, yeah, lads? It was, I mean, yeah. the, the amount of time we were ripping out of each other, like, oh, I'm ahead of you now, and I'm, now I'm ahead of you. And I mean, Ben was even sneaking dives in without telling us. Just <laughs> <laughs> it was a, So, the, the, I mean, at the beginning of this, uh, the species comp for the start point, I was leading, and the only reason I think I ended up coming ninth was because of the fact that I was ribbing everybody and saying, <laughs> I've been spearfishing six months and I'm first. So <laughs> what are you lot doing? Um, Dave O'Callaghan soon sorted that out. Perks of being retired. But um, yeah, it was, it, last year was, created so many memories, mm. um, you know, and, and even banter 
um, mm. sort of between the groups. Um, shout out to the East Devon Spearows. Um, it's it. It was you'd go for a dive, think you did well, and then suddenly you'd find out that somebody else has been down the road and they'd caught twice as much in three different species. And it was like, why didn't you say you were going out? I'd have come with you. And it's just all banter. So, no, it's an amazing, an amazing season. Part of my, like, these species comps that happen, they're, they're kind of everywhere now. I like them. I like the idea of them. Mm. The only thing that sort of stops them from happening, I think, is the administrative burden. Like some poor bastard has to go through, <laughs> oh, yeah. make sure that people yeah, are lying, a lot of drama cheating. In these things, right? Yeah, yeah. There's going to be photos <laughs> and dates, and then they've got to tally it all yeah. on some spreadsheet that's updated regularly so that everyone can see the progress and no one's accused of anything. Wouldn't it be easy if there was like some app in the space that just helped us all do this with ease? I think. I reckon that. I be think it cool. would, but I'd say, I mean, that the could start be the spirit point hangout UK, at, at the start point UK species <laughs> comp last year made uh, a Big Brother look like Balamori, um, and it was <laughs> it was just like what, especially. I mean, it, even to literally the final few hours, um, there was drama, um, <laughs> and it was just like what, and it really did show the true colours of a of a select few, but it was more, it was the competition between friends, but I think the admin of something like that, again, it depends on how much you anticipate people joining in. Um, I think it's the same that we're going to find with the BSA. It's how much you're willing to volunteer your time Mm. for your passion and love of the sport. Um, I think next year, if start point um, decide not to run a species comp, I think, there's probably going to be conversation within the BSA um, to have something similar because it does bring a lot of sort of motivation and difference of species. You're not just going out on a boat and smashing your two bass a day or 10 pollock each. Um, You know, you're having to think and hunt differently. So with the crustaceans, you know, as we all know, there's no point in taking your spear gun when you go and finding lobsters and crabs um you know go out and specifically hunt one thing and it just makes you focus um so yeah we're hoping for something this year i think i think you guys are onto a good thing like like when i started spearfishing i remember you know you you do realize like oh you only ever shoot exactly what you want so it is selective um and it is sustainable when it's practiced correct but sometimes we kind of deny the fact that we're a very specific form of pressure often on a very small part of a coastline yeah. and we're a unique pressure. And so we need to have that awareness because some species are very vulnerable to spearfishing as a unique pressure. So there, there is a level of maturity and understanding I think that everyone has to have. And I don't necessarily think that laws and regulations are the best way to inform people's ethics. Cause if people just know they tend to do, or want to do the right thing anyway. So it's just trying to educate people so that they understand. I think it's more effective than laws and regs. What do you guys think? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, think, I, I mean, sorry, Ben. I, the only thing I'd say on that is that, yes, the most recent form of spearfishing may be unique in that we have considerably advanced the technology that we use while spearfishing. However, fishing from the shore has been something that has gone on for hundreds of generations i mean i i don't know the research but i would i would put my house on you know it's been going on for thousands of years um we as a species have been hunting from the shore for a long time um i think combined with the likes of commercial spe- commercial fishing um the sea has taken a massive toll um you know it, it's been hammered and the commercial side is where I believe um, the focus should be more on, but also the same as with plastic recycling and every other type of sustainability and eco-friendliness. Um, we all need to take account for you know what we're doing. Um, I'm the, one, one of the conversations that we're going to have in the BSA this year is about um, things like RAS during competitions. If people aren't going to be taking the fish home and they're shooting them specifically for sport, um, you know, in, in whether we should allow that 
as a, as a country or as a competitive nation. Um, and it's the, the other side of it is if I were to go out on the boat and I did with family the other, you know, a couple of weeks back and I land on you know, a, a shoal of eight pound Pollock thousands strong, you're damn right. I'm going to be filling the freezer, but I'm not, doing that every day whereas the hunter gatherer side of what we used to be in what i would say was the old school fishing we had to go out every day but there was no commercial pressure so the fishing of the shoreline is completely different i think it's such a difficult thing to weigh up and have conversations about and it's just it's just being as sustainable inverted commas as as you possibly can <clears throat> Yeah, what, what, I think what? you do have to be careful though. Mm. I used to go um, river fishing for trout when I was younger. And it's quite a small river, so it can't really take a lot of of pressure. So you used to be quite aware of that, and you know, certainly something that my my dad built into me that you know, you, if you if you catch a two pound trout, you you put it back and maybe take one a year or something like that, because those are the fish that are going to you know provide the next generation. We see it with scallops, so we've got a few local scallop spots that over the last year or so have been a lot less productive because they've been hammered. So, you know, it's, it's, I think it's more obvious where you've got um, like a smaller location, like a river or lake or something like that, or you've got a population that doesn't move around like the scallops, but it, I think it applies to, to all kinds of fish. And, you know, going back to the species hunt, it's quite nice if you take different species because then that one species doesn't have all that pressure. Mm. Um, I think going back to what Anthony's saying, the, the things that annoy me are where, you have um, fish like wastage and whether that's us shooting fish that we're not going to eat at competitions or whether that's commercial fishermen netting things that they throw back that, that no one's going to eat or the seals are going to eat. Um, those are the things that are, are annoy me most, but we, we do have to be careful. You're right. Chuck. I'll, I'll be honest. I think um, every type of fisher um, often looks over their shoulder and blames the other type of fisher. Like, he, yeah, and, and I'm not saying you guys are doing this, but like, sometimes commercial fishing has these these terrible practices built in due to people trying to regulate them and then it creates issues like bycatch you know like we're yeah. trying to fish for this species but we catch all these other species and then we're not allowed to have them because they're not size and yeah. so it's not actually sometimes the fisher person's fault it's just the nature of the system and stuff I, I tend mm -hmm. to I tend to agree with you guys. Like, there's definitely issues in every form of fishing, um, but I tend not to want to do the work of the eco terrorists for them. Like, mm -hmm. you know, there's enough shows like Sea Spiracy trying to ruin every <laughs> person's you know enjoyment of fishing for for me to want to not want to help them. I tend to want to just look after my own backyard and worry about spear fishing because that's what I do. I think if if every person takes a serious like look at what they're doing and tries to contribute to it like i i've seen a like in the british spearfishing and 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 excuse me this is just my observation as someone sitting in an armchair like two you know like thousands of kilometers <laughs> away um i have seen a lot of hate for commercial fishing in the uk i know there are some practices in there that you know give you guys the shits like scallop dredging um uh, like the, so the I saw a super trawler a while ago, and there was so much animosity towards it on the on the British page. Why 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 is it you guys have such a strong dislike for commercial fishing? Because uh, down here in Australia, New Zealand, we tend to know a lot of the commercial fishers, or have we 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 sort of see ourselves as like distinct groups of fishers, but we're kind of all together because there's this other side of it. Um, these greenies that want to stop us all from any form of fishing like it, it, like i see people with that what's that stupid sea shepherd sticker on their car like I, i've even seen spiro support sea shepherd it, written into their values is uh, they are anti all forms of fishing even spear fishing so like sometimes i yeah this is kind of i'm just speaking here but this is kind of what i what i feel strongly about <laughs> I think with the UK, and again, although I've been part of the fishing um, culture, Christ, since I can remember, so since I was probably a sperm, um, <laughs> I have no idea how I was conceived, may have been on a rock. You won a race. But, um, <laughs> exactly, I was dragged. But um, it, w with commercial fishing in the UK, I think, first of all, um, a lot of 
a lot of the waters in the UK are fished not only by our own fishermen commercially, but mm. also by um, other European countries. So you would have industrial um, fishing vessels, be it trawlers or netters, that are freezer ships that would come in and take out hundreds and I mean, I probably would bet to say thousands of tons per day of fish from ah, the waters okay. that surround the UK. And you would also then get the, I don't want to say conspiracy, but the 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 politics behind that that is buffered by the commercial sector of fishing, throwing money at the legislation. Mm. So in the UK, you, you've got, yeah, I, I don't want to say grassroots, but I, I'm going to call it grassroots fishing, which is your spear fishing, your rod and line, and your your weekender that takes out a boat. And then you have these massive trawlers um, that come in and just wipe out absolutely everything. There are local trawlers and local commer- local commercial fishermen um, that really do and are in touch with local communities. So there's a couple local to us in Brixham that one of the commercial boats, he'll go out, his catch is only sold on the dock in Brixham when he comes back in. And you can't get fresher than that. And he sells out often. Um, But when you see not only the foreign commercials coming in and wiping out the local population of fish but also the local big commercial ventures taking all of that fish and exporting it and you sort of as a local and like you were saying you you want to look after your own backyard Mm. like in devon and cornwall that is where i would class devon cornwall and court and dorset my backyard to be i want to look after all of those waters i'm an advocate for looking after the whole of the uk's waters but if i see a commercial vessel that is dredging or netting all of the local population and then sending them to some other country or to become feed for a farmed fish Mm. enterprise it's just like it just it feels like it takes the piss yeah (laughs) i can relate like here like that, we had this huge marine park they planned down in sort of um, southern central coast New South Wales, um, which is a fair bit south of me. Uh, it was a marine park plan, and they basically planned to lock out eighty five percent or ninety percent of all possible um, shore based spearfishing entry, like ground. So then you was gonna, that on Netflix? Uh, no, no, this was just a. I did a podcast with a bunch of these guys, but this was a, a bit of legislation that they try to push through. And then we, everyone got involved in, in fighting it. But the more you think about it, the more you go, well, 85% of our seafood is exported, you know, so you can't even buy our own local stuff here. Um, and, and that's not due even due to cost pressures. It's just the way that the commercial fishing um, sector is set up. And then we're going to lock out grassroots fishers. So like I, I identify with what you said, like just mum and dad taking their kids down from the rocks fishing and then, some of us eventually get silly enough to jump in with a pair of fins and try and shoot stuff. But, you know, we, arguably that's more effective form of conservation and teaching people about the environment than than any other show you could watch or something like that, getting in there and getting amongst it and learning about your local mm-hmm. environment. Like Ben was talking about trout fishing, you know, in a small microcosm like, like, a, like a river system. You know, if you do take out a fish, you actually do affect possibly – hundreds maybe a kilometer of reef system so uh, uh, of river system so you've got to you you develop this awareness by learning through doing and we want to take it away from people and then make everything commercial it gives me the shits as well so i can relate to what you said mm. anyway this is a delightfully friendly lovely conversation yeah all i was gonna yeah all, all i'd say to this is I am probably as far from an eco warrior as can possibly be. Mm. Um, I mean, my, my daytime job is I'm a used car salesman, so you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm <laughs> digging up and using the dinosaurs as fuel um, as much as humanly possible. But yeah. it, it, 
with with fishing, it just seems to me. I went I went to Sainsbury's, which is I mean you probably heard of it um, over there, but is a local supermarket akin to Tesco's or Waitrose or any other of the big supermarket chains. And I mean, I'm in I'm just down the road from Dawlish, which is a very small, um, only really a, a what we call a grockle or a holiday resort town, um, and there really isn't any fishing but it's a beautiful seaside and there's a lot of fish in that sea going to sainsbury's and the only fish that i see on the shelves are farmed bass from vietnam bassa from turkey (laughs) and other fish and prawns and stuff that it's it just doesn't make sense when i'm from legislation not allowed to sell scallops Mm. i'm not allowed to sell any spear caught fish um and again it's just it just doesn't it's i'm as i say i'm not an eco warrior but i'm not stupid mm-hmm. the legislation that has been put in is stupid mm-hmm. and is been put in by people that haven't got a fucking clue mm-hmm. and it's yeah it it just it it shocks me every now and then <laughs> as i say stood in sainsbury's i haven't bought fish since i started spearfishing because i love fish but again that's part of the sustainability aspect i'm only going to eat fish that i've caught um but when you stood there and you're thinking i don't know what waters that fish has come out of it's come from thailand vietnam or wherever the question is why is all of the fish that is caught in the countries that like fishing Australia, UK, every other part of the world. Why are they all exported? And where the hell are they exported to and what for? Yeah. Because like you say, your fish in Oz, you know, one of the biggest things is export. Where are they going? Mm. And where, what are they going for? Yeah, this is it. And we have strictly managed fisheries, but we're quite happy to take out fish from these third world countries that have no or very little management practice. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Delightful conversation. Let's move into <laughs> the uh, the fun world of cooking. Um, ben, I'm looking at your Instagram profile. You're the Spiro Kitchen, mate. You yeah. you're a bit of an artist. You you like to dress the old food up a bit. Oh, like, mate, I love it. Yeah, it's yeah. um, I, I I've always been into cooking beforehand, but mm. there's just something special about catching your own food, growing your own food, and mm. and putting it all together. Well, you know, I don't just but but by um by you know most things that go go with it i i do have a garden i'm not very good at gardening um but i really like the idea of bringing all these things together yeah, to, sure. to make something that you know is, is a bit like um it's quite rewarding and um there's a sense of achievement there where you mm. put something in front of your kids and you can say oh daddy caught that or you know daddy grew that and and stuff like that and plus food when it looks nice, it just tastes nicer as well, doesn't it? Mm-mm. There's something in that. Oh, I, I don't know. Like, I've got the plating skills <laughs> of an ogre, as my nickname suggests. <laughs> but, uh, well, but I haven't seen your book yet, Shrek. So, so oh. um, 99 Spirits, can we get hold of that in, um, yeah, in the UK? I don't have a shop in the UK stocking them yet. I do need to get them over. I have seen a number of books there, but like sometimes I'm spending like $100 shipping just to get a package to the UK. So I'll we'll have, to, we'll have you... to discuss after this where I will create a shop and stock them for you. I was thinking about sending you boys for some prizes for your podcast and a couple of copies for you guys as well, though. But, um, yeah, we'll get on to that That'd after the show. Um, yeah, but as I said, plating skills of an ogre, it's not something I'm good about. What I like doing, though, is just getting the kids involved um, with yeah. um, with any sort of cooking. Like, I just do the – do you guys do the, the salt and vinegar chippy um, crumb over there? Have you tried that? No. So like panko crumb or? Yeah, but you just have, so you have your egg, your egg mix, flour, plain flour, yeah. and then you um, just get a, a bag of salt and vinegar chippies and you just break them up in the bag into a really fine crumb, then tip them out and then you just do your egg, flour, uh, sorry, a flour, egg, um, and then your salt and vinegar chippy crumb and then just shallow fry them. And, oh, yeah. uh, and, to, and, to, and to translate for everybody here, <laughs> what's a chippy? Ch- no, I think Shrek's talking about chip. crisps. It's a potato chip. 
<laughs> oh, <laughs> Chris. A potato oh, crisp. <laughs> a potato crisp. Yeah. I like salt and vinegar chippies. Like, yeah, oh, well, got... I don't know. what Everyone calls them something different. Yeah, I forget you guys call them crisps. I don't know what they call them <laughs> in America either, but aren't these cultural little terms? No, in America, ones? they're chips. Well, that chips they're chips. Oh, yeah, we have chips here too. Well, yeah, crisps. Yeah, no, we're crisps, yeah, yeah, use the crisps, man. <laughs> yeah, walkers. But, but like the kids love it because like you chop you chop your fillets up like pretty fine um, into sort of like long chicken nuggets almost like sort of similar size, and then um, they get involved and shallow frying takes like you know ninety seconds, two and a half minutes depending on how you've cut them, and then um, everyone has them in wraps and they just love being part of the experience and um, it's really easy and yum. Smother it in some tartare sauce or tartar, as Americans call it. What do you guys call it there? Do you have tartare? Tartar. 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 No, uh, is it tartar or is that steak tartar? I thought you said tartar 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 when someone was was going tartar tartar. Tartar sauce. (laughs) Tartar. The Queen's going Uh, by. I know she's not. Talking about food, though, um, my one enjoyment with food is. is actually converting a lot of family members, like eating different fish that mm. people in the UK just wouldn't eat. I mean, I don't know about you boys, but like a lot of my family's never ever eaten a mullet, for example. And um, you know, that's the one thing. Like we, we last year, we went on holiday down to Cornwall and I caught a few mullet, and you know, dissimilar to what you just said, Shrek. You know, just crumbed it up and shallow fried it. And, they absolutely loved it. They didn't know yeah, what right. they were eating, but they loved it. And then afterwards, I was like, yeah, you just, eat, you just eat in a mullet. And, then, you know, straight away, they're thinking, what, the ones that live in the harbour? But, yeah, you know, it's 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 awesome, like, converting people to try stuff they haven't ever tried. And just, you know, the way that Ben dishes everything up, you wouldn't even know what's going on anyway. It just looks amazing. <laughs> with, that, uh, with, with mullet, like, they are a sort of dirty bottom fish. Um, and there is a stigma there. And, and, like, I don't know why it is. Like, they're an oily fish. Um, so you yeah. guys like you like shallow Probably, frying yeah. them with panko crumb? How else do you do them? I had um, well, I, I one smoked yesterday load, actually. Like... Oh, did you? Uh, yeah, I, I, I um I froze one up over the over the summer because I just had too many mullet and I didn't know what to do with it. And um, bloody delicious! Just some panko breadcrumbs on a bed of I don't know tomato and courgette and aubergine, a bit of pepper, a bit of olive oil. Just delicious. Stick it in the oven for twenty five minutes and you, you just can't go wrong, really. Yeah, well, nice. one, of the, one of the stories that, uh, that, that Paul Maxwell, who's a South African friend of ours, I think he's on the committee for the London International Club, um, has for mullet. <laughs> and he's, he's still got this sort of sour taste in his mouth about it. And there was, it was something, they, they were in a harbour catching mullet and uh, they, were on, they were diving from a boat and they caught a mullet, gutted it, but as they were gutting it, Obviously, mullet are a bottom feeder or a what we call a poo feeder. <laughs> and they gutted it and out from the guts came half a bog roll and a load of human oh, wow. poo. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> then, whenever I go on a boat, Paul's like, we're not shooting any fucking mullet. <laughs> I'm not having well, that poo fish. <laughs> me and Rich were out on a, a – we did a little camping trip, didn't we, Rich? And you remember I, yeah. I shot that mullet and I tell you what, that stank, that mullet. So I think it's, they're all different. <laughs> There's a bit of variety there. That mullet, I swear, like most mullet, when you you cut all, so you cut all the red red flesh off because that's line. the bit that tastes a little bit funky. Yep. Blood. And most of them are fairly like white underneath. You mm. know, it's not nice white firm fish. This mullet was like proper greasy. Yeah. It was brown. I mean, it was dark, so we were shining on torch. Light. <laughs> like, you could feel it. Like it had like this layer of grease on it. Mm. I don't know. I don't have to think what it what it didn't taste very like, nice, did everyone it? says to me, it wraps anyway. Everyone <laughs> says there's no such thing as a shit fish. I go, nah, there are. There are yeah, <laughs> <quite a few. laughs> like, I watched my, the dude. My favorite way my favorite way of cooking mullet up last year though was to like whack a whole load of Tex Mex seasoning on them and chuck them in the smoker. Oh but yeah. If you've ever tried smoking some up, yeah, they they're awesome in the smoker. I was gonna ask yeah, you about really your good. smoking setup. So what you just got a dirty hot smoker and what's the Tex Mex uh, Tex Tex Mex yeah. seasoning? Is that just like a taco mix or something? Uh, yeah, it's similar. Like, uh, I think it's actually some sort of like barbecue Tex-Mex season that we go there, and it's just something cheap and cheerful. And um, yeah, I just got a real basic setup to be honest. Just you know, it's um, you know, I'm, I'm actually from South Africa, so I call it braai anyway. And um, yeah, so I just chuck it in, in the braai and smoke it in there. So yeah, yeah, awesome. So, Best way to cook mullet. So you're using sugar um, and salt as well, or is it just Tex-Mex? 
No, no, Brian. I just literally text Max a lot, um, left it in the fridge for a bit, and then just chucked it in. It's great. I mean, there's probably better ways of doing it, to be honest. I'm no, I'm no high end chef, but you know, if you're in the, no, you're, you're pretty you're good. You're both pretty good, actually. I, I've always been impressed with it. You, you don't share it much <laughs> yeah. but It's funny with a lot of Spiros, eh? Like, um, someone got offended with me calling the contributors to 99 Spiro recipes Spiro chefs. And uh, they're like, like, oh, you, you're not a chef, you know, like, and uh, like, there is definitely a skill set with formal chefs, but it's surprising the the secret little ninja skills that most Spiros have with cooking fish and mm. dealing with them and stuff like that. And it's a little bit like every other part of spearfishing. You just you watch people in their element and what they normally do with seafood, and it's actually pretty clever. Like a lot of Spiros, mm. they do know how to make the most of their catch. I'm I'm always quietly impressed with some of my friends that I consider actually cavemen. And, uh, and one of, the, one of the things that I'm always actually amazed by and that I've sort of realized since watching a lot of YouTube is in the UK, a lot of our fish are, I'd say probably, you know, at, at a push, you might get a 10 pound fish, mm. but versus the fishmongery of Oz with the Pelagics and America, filleting the smaller fish seems so much harder mm. than filleting oh. a massive fish at 100% yeah. I, I sort of I watch a YouTube like before I go you know we caught two bass or a couple of pollock and I'm like yeah, yeah, yeah I'm gonna fill it um, let's watch a YouTube just to refresh my memory how to pin bone yeah. and then they're like yeah two swipes and it's like oh yeah they're like half of a fish is falling off I'm like oh, I've been here for 45 minutes and this fish has been <laughs> molested <laughs> <laughs> by my knife <laughs> it's like my god yeah i i i'm gonna be honest like one thing I, I i get snobbier and snobbier like some of the small species are you know delightful on a plate and stuff if you want to do like a reverse butterfly and scale them and piss around with them then fantastic do that i tend to i tend to just want to shoot everything over like three or four pound <laughs> just so like i got i got i got options with it you know like um but yeah everyone's sort of different I like I like the UK fishery. It seems like you guys get some big sort of congregations of like particularly pollock and bass and stuff. Are they spawning aggregations or are they always is it just like a no, seasonal Not so seeding much when, when we're shooting them. We we do a lot of diving from the shore and those fish tend to congregate around well usually around the, the winter months for spawning and well we haven't been diving for 3 months so you get the idea. But yeah, generally speaking, they're, they're showing up to hunt and to kind of prepare themselves for that spawning over the summer months. It's the same with like flatfish and stuff like that. They'll be quite thin early on in the season. They'll get thicker and thicker and thicker, and then they'll go deep and, and spawn and do their thing and, and be back next year, hopefully. Um, but yeah, I think, yeah, there's, there's, there's a, a, I guess, a bit of a stigma in terms of, um, you know, shooting fish that are spawning. And, you know, we, we've got to, bear these things in mind when when we're, when we're shooting fish if it's a big aggregation of fish and we're going to net the whole lot or or go and um you know obliterate it then that's not going to be a very productive thing in in the next year mm. but um nine times out of ten we're not shooting the the spawning species mm. i was going to say during my i mean my, my first year i wouldn't have said that any of the fish that i've shot were anything other than hunting themselves like the bass and the pollock that I've shot and the other species, you know, the flatfish, um, they're just before dusk and they're starting to hunt the crabs and they're fattening up. I, would, I wouldn't I would have ever said that we were hunting fish that were spawning. This probably tends to be my sort of skewed YouTube perspective. So, like, when I'm looking at UK spearfishing, I'm watching a handful of videos a year, so... Quite often it'll be like the most watched Joe PK one and he is yeah. in a big aggregation in clean water or yep. something, you know, like something like that. So that that's probably what's given me a little bit of a of a skewed uh, perspective. Yeah, and a lot of the time that's not necessarily from the shore, which is where we've done most of our diving, at least this year. That's like offshore pinnacles yep. where they all congregate to, to, to do their thing. Killfish with precision and power, sending shafts from a stable platform with Kill Shot Spear Guns. Made in the Florida Keys by Ed Martin, you're buying American made dependable spear guns. Get $30 off any Kill Shot Spear Gun at killshotspearguns.com. Yes and amen, Nova. That's $30 off American made performance spear guns 
at killshotsbeerguns.com. It says if they're in the shop or on the phone, they can cash in by saying, crikey, mate, or the Noob Spiro podcast sent me. Check them out at killshotsbeerguns.com, based in the Florida Keys. This podcast is brought to you by aqualite.com.au. This is the best solution bar none for staying hydrated in the ocean. If you're a Spiro, it's an absolute no-brainer. It's a game changer if you're doing extended trips and the cramp starts to set in and uh, the old body's telling you, hey, that's enough. Just get hydrated and it will save you a whole heap of woe. It's a groundbreaking product that can help you to stay hydrated. It's got low sugar, it's less acidic than other options on the market, it's rapid absorption, help you to maintain performance. Dehydration of just one to 2% can affect your mental and physical performance by up to six or 7%. And as when you're spearfishing, you can tell when dehydration is starting to affect you because the equalization goes out the window. Get Aqualite at aqualite.com.au. It's scientific rehydration that Spiros know and trust. I know because one works there, and that's why we've set up this discount code for you. 10% off when you use the code NoobSpiro at aqualite.com.au. Check it out. Australian-made hydration products tailored for Spiros and a whole bunch of other people that suffer from dehydration too. But check it out at aqualite.com.au. Use the code NoobSpiro to save 10%. Got a sweet deal for you today, guys. Go to freedivingfamily.com and learn from Adam Stern and a select team of experts on different disciplines. There's Frenzel, Advanced Frenzel, and Hands Free Equalization, Mouthful, Deep Frenzel Equalization, Bifitting Essentials. These are courses that will give you the 1% that will allow you to improve. Use the code SPIRO to get 20% off any course at freedivingfamily.com. Again, that's the code SPIRO to get 20% off at freedivingfamily.com. Thanks, Adam and team. Love it. Let's uh, let's go around the circle and talk about, I'd love it if you guys share like a, maybe your proudest fish to date, proudest hunt. doesn't have to necessarily be the greatest fish, just... What did you do right? Who wants to start? I'm thinking Richard's starting. Richard. <laughs> well, where do I start? Let me uh, let me think. So I'm, last year, um, I actually won the species on between the three of us um, because I managed to shoot a, um, a particular bream, a uh, golden-haired bream. So the, the way you hunt them is you have to be super stealthy. And I was given the mark by one of the club members, and it's a super shallow mark. And I was literally cruising along over this little ledge, and it's loads of eel grass, which is a real fine um, type of seagrass that we get here. And the the, the bream are just sat in that seagrass, just resting. And the minute you even so much as move this beer gun, they were just off. Um, so yeah, so I managed to find a group of them, school of them, and I spooked a few to begin with, but. I had to try and keep still for as long as possible to try and get as close as I could and just let the wind push me into him. And eventually I got close enough and the spear was in already the right location for me just to pull the trigger and nab one. And uh, that's how I managed to actually get one to secure one for the species comp. So, yeah, it wasn't the biggest one, but it, it did the job. And that was my best fish, I think, last year for sure. Um, how big did yeah, it go? I mean, uh, it wasn't the biggest fish. It was probably about a pound and a half. Mm. Um, so it's yeah, not the biggest fish by any means, but there were some bigger ones in the school. But yeah, I mean they they don't get big like that for you know for no reason. They they're a bit smarter on there. <laughs> they're trying to get closer to the bigger ones. There were a couple of skills that you sort of brushed on that I want to point out. Like one is that you you knew exactly where these fish were going to be, so you you positioned your body in the right direction, and then you allowed current to do the work for you. And then you already had your spear pointed in the general direction, so you only have to make small adjustments without moving your whole body and changing everything, and that's what spooks fish. Um, mm-hmm. That 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 would make me happy too. When you get those little things right, it just it doesn't even really matter about the fish. It's just like a self-mastery, I think. There's like some real pleasure you take in it, particularly when you take out a comp, I guess. Yeah, no, it was, it was an accumulation of things, really. As you say, it was all those hunting techniques which – I had to put to practice because I hadn't ever hunted that fish before, actually, and or targeted, shall I say. And being given that mark and knowing that they were there, it almost puts like that extra element of pressure on you, I think. 
because you know that they're there. It's just trying to like, find them and actually shoot one. And being able to do it, yeah, it was, it was great. It was, it was it, yeah, it was a highlight for me really for last year. And um, it's definitely one of those fishing we'll be targeting this year for sure. So when when you spooked those first few, did you like um, did you sort of spend some time on the surface on your breathe up, thinking like, okay, how am I am I going to do this? Did you was there like a visual? It, well, it was it wasn't even I didn't even need a breather because I was literally in about three foot four foot of water. Okay, I mean. Oh. I was like super shallow, and um, so yeah. When when I spoke, when I spoke the first big one, I just thought, right, don't you know, just try and relax even more than I already was. And you got to keep in mind, um, the water temperature was already starting to drop because this is the late part of the year. So we're talking maybe, I don't know, I guess around 13, 14 degrees. So when you're keeping still for that long. You know, I was probably keeping still for about 40 minutes just to shoot that fish. Yeah. Um, trying to get amongst them. You know, my, I'm already shivering, I'm cold, I'm just feeling miserable already. But it's just the element of the hunt that keeps you going. And yeah, I spooked the first one and I just made sure that the spear gun was sort of tucked in but points in the right direction. And as soon as a fish came in front of it, I knew I could just pull the trigger mm. because I knew from the first fish that if I moved an inch, they were just going to shoot off. You're, so, you're you're a bigger unit too. So when you cool down, do you? Because like with me, I'm a big unit as well. So like when I get cold, I tend to like it takes me quite a while to warm up. But then sometimes like if I'm warm, I'll stay warm for quite a while as well. So it's like I'll have a slower sort of temperature cycle compared to some of my more <coughs> uh, wind effect easily wind affected <laughs> friends. Put it that way. I, I, I wish I could say that straight to be honest, but um, as the lads like will, will say, I tend to take double the lube with me than they do because trying to get into the wetsuit sometimes is a bit of a, a bit Mate, of they, But they get tight, you know. They just keep constricting. <laughs> the suits get smaller as you get older. I find. Yeah, my my, my wetsuit's actually got a few holes in it now as well from uh, being Ooh. overstretched. But you know that that doesn't help either, really. I mean, I think my wetsuit's made of like ninety percent blackwitch by now. <laughs> uh, for anyone for anyone wondering what is this wetsuit glue and uh, and yeah, so yeah, I mean. I find I get quite cold anyway in the water. I mean, I'm in five mil in the winter. These lads use seven mil sometimes, but I'm in a five mil all year round. And I just, you know, I just do what I can really with it. To be yeah, honest. but you say five mil, you're five mil that is actually more like 0.5 mil considering it's fucking older than I am. <laughs> <laughs> Anthony, I don't know if you're one to lecture, Richard, because I heard that you can't even be bothered to wash your wetsuit. <laughs> <laughs> I I wouldn't put it like that. I would say delegation. <laughs> and hence the reason I'm chairman. Um, <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, I think in all honesty, I think my missus, Rachel, bless her heart, is um, just fed up of the fact that I come home and get my pissy wetsuit off because I have no, um, oh my God, my hair's gone blank, Pissette. Oh, yeah. Um And yeah, I sort of, I throw it on the floor of the shower because I'm showered and then I take sort of an hour after to chill out, grab a drink, grab some munch and you know chill out after a long day mm. and by the time that i get back she's been pleasant enough to have mint washed it and hung it over the shower door um but it's now coming a case where if she doesn't do it she'll get told off mm. so i feel so <laughs> sorry for her oh, me too. <laughs> you might be like that other bloke though i had this guy join the the noob spirit community on facebook the other day and there's these three questions that i get people to answer before i let them in because that way i know that they actually want to be in the group and they're a real Spiro and they're not just going to try and sell shit to people. You not know, a robot. The first, yeah, the first, yeah, exactly. The first question I ask is like, what's your greatest struggle spearfishing in this bloke wrote? Finding a large enough percent. <laughs> 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 I was like, what a wanker. You're in. And then just let him straight in there. He didn't even have to answer the other questions. Good on him. <laughs> Bless him. Um, we were talking about hunting though. Anthony, or a species you're like you're real proud of in the last little while. Um, what's a species that you that st sort of stands out in your memory, or, or a fish that you um, hunted? The, there's a few. I was thinking about it while Richard was talking, and it, it the, the one that actually stands out is more about the people than necessarily the fish, um, and sort of my own personal experience. So there was it was one that uh, a dive that Ben came on. Um, with me and Paul Maxwell and we went down 
quite away from here. Um, we took our bus on its first ever test drive before we did the Scotland trip and uh, went, went down. It was me, Paul and Ben. Got to the place, got in, absolutely gorgeous waters. I mean, we had five metre viz, five to seven metre viz probably. Yeah. Um, stunning beach, got in. And within, Christ, what, 25 metres ashore, within 10 minutes, I'd already caught down near my PB bass. Um, and it was probably six or seven pounds, maybe five. You know, I'm I'm a big man, so I always overcompensate. Um, and so I put it on the stringer, and I was then pumped for the rest of the day. I was like, I ain't getting out until I've got two bass and 30 pollock and a load of other fish. And within sort of like another half an hour, we changed direction. The tide was just moving. Uh, ben and Paul were moving over. And at one point I noticed Paul sort of was bumping into my bow shot float. And I was like, oh, okay, sorry, I'm in his way, so I'll move. Half an hour down the road, I caught another bass. And so I turned around and went to go to my float, went to put the smaller bass on my float, and there was no other giant bass. And so I'm going, what the fuck? Like, I'm looking around going, is there seals? Is there something has taken the bass off of my stringer? So, yeah. like, what the... So I'm then thinking, well, the way the stringer was hung was as though it had fallen off. And I'd got my GoPro on my, hel- on my head um, attached to my mask. So I then spent 45 minutes, and I'd got the GoPro footage the wrong way around. So it basically recorded 45 minutes of me swearing being really angry with myself that I'd lost this bass, spending 45 minutes looking for this bass. And so anyway, 45 minutes later, I'm just like, I'm going to have to catch another bass. And the footage that I've got of me diving down, I did a really good breath hold. And I was, I hit the bottom, got right into the kelp just before um, a big, I would say a bommy, um, but a rock outcrop with a load of kelp on the top. And I was not coming up until I'd caught another bass. And so I did a couple of grunts. I saw five or six decent-sized bass go past, and I grunted again. And I sat there, and I was getting to the end of my breath hold. And this was probably at about a minute and 15, minute and 20. And this bass came cruising in, and I shot the bass. got up to the surface, and I was like, thank fuck for that. Like, my God. Like, I can rest easy. Go back to my float there's two bass on my float and I'm like, uh, what, what I'm, I'm now on three bass, but what, what, what's going on? Paul (laughs) had been fun and taken the bass, my first bass from my float and was carrying it around for half an hour. (laughs) And so it was like, (laughs) I then caught up with catching my two bass and by that time, Paul had then gone back to my float while I was underneath, put the bass back on my float, had come to the surface and seen the other two bass. And so luckily, um, Ben hadn't caught anything that day. So I gifted, um, obviously, you know, gave that bass to Ben, um, one of the bigger ones. And it was just the the frustration that I experienced for the hour and 15 minutes where I was just so annoyed that I'd shot something, known I'd got it, and then it had got lost. Yeah, And yeah. my annoyance of losing that fish um that 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 was more of a memory than catching any other big fish for me yeah it's funny how things like that can stand out here mm. <clears throat> you mentioned a french dive brown brand that sounds like a a friend of mine's past poo experience uh, is that the correct pronunciation you guys are right next door to the french so Bo- 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 Chat. Yeah, Beauchat, B E U C H A T. Is that how, is that really how you say it? Because I always like I look at the shop and I'm, how would you say it? Beauchat. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that's the English pronunciation. <laughs> that's, <good. laughs> that's trying too hard. Uh, no, okay. I, I, I would say Beauchat. Okay, uh, Ben, Rich. So our friends, yeah, I'm with you, man. Yeah. A friend's yeah. past poo <laughs> event. That's how I always remember the brand. Yeah, yeah if, if somebody calls it Beauchat, yeah. um, they were brought up in, in Chelsea in London. But you, you, even over here, like everyone battles with it. There's a few brand names that are the same. Like It's just it's funny watching Spiros try to pronounce stuff. It's great. <laughs> the, the Greeks have got a few interesting brands that everyone butchers too, I think. Like, I hope, yeah. Um, ben. Like you, what? Um, what do we got there? 
Pathos. Uh, Pathos. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, there's there's another one. I'm sure of it. What about the big speak? Oh, Mythicon. Uh, there's more. There's I don't know. I was thinking of something before. Can't remember. <laughs> Dementia. Yeah, dementia. Dementia's set in. It is. It was 6 a.m. when we started in my defense. <laughs> ben, for you? Yeah, I, I really struggled with this one um, as Richard was talking. Like, I've, I can. Um, Maybe it was that the one that got of, away. Yeah, well, no, not, not, not even that, really. I think, I've, you know. I've, Maybe it's the the red mullet. So the red mullet, I mentioned it earlier. It was something that I kind of set my sights on quite early in the season and um, did quite a lot of, re- you know, as quite methodical square, whatever people want to call me. And um, I just, I did my research and I kind of, I kind of knew where they were going to be. And the first time I um, I caught one, it was, the, the viz was about a metre. Like it was insanely bad. And Anthony... You you just joined me, hadn't you? I was like, mate, I'm so excited! I've caught this red mullet. It's not this big. It's like this big because they're quite small. They're goat fish. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, I was, I was so excited. I'm really excited. Anthony, of course, he comes in and catches two, doesn't he? It's typical bloody Anthony. <laughs> Um, but I just of remember which, that moment thinking. Can I just interject? <laughs> were disallowed from the start point competition because they were undersized. Hashtag yeah, they drama. Were, they were de- definitely borderline. <laughs> Mine oh, was definitely God. bigger. <laughs> Yours was bigger. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just remember that sense of achievement because I, I know I'd like done my research, I was been looking for them. I'd kind of had my sights on them because someone else had caught them. I'd be like, yeah, that'd be really cool. They're supposed to taste amazing. Um, that was pretty cool. And I caught a couple of Gurnard this year as well, and I was quite excited by them because they're a little bit more unusual. You don't see many Spiros catch them. And um, I think a lot of that is, and the Red Mullet to some extent, is like getting your eye in. Like certainly the, my first you know few months of spearfishing, I saw fuck all really. But this year, it's been a little bit different. And, you know, you, you slow down, you wait, you focus on things, you imagine the fish being there, and all of a sudden, sometimes the fish is actually there. Um, so, yeah, maybe like Red Mullet or, or, or the Gurnard, which, um, yeah, both delicious fish as well. Absolutely beautiful. It's such a pretty fish. Mm. I keep I keep wanting to make some bad jokes about the royal family. <laughs> I've been really like just trying to be self controlled. I'm, I'm gonna say I'm gonna say that I have got a couple warmed up though. I'm just giving you the tip. Um, sorry about that. Not like Liz then. She's a bit cold. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no, not about. I'm the banned game. from the UK now. I'm getting deported. <laughs> too soon. Too I'm soon. going straight to Oz. Yeah. Get expatriated. As a as a convict, <laughs> steal a loaf of bread or something, and you can make us all feel a sense of nostalgia. Have you got issues with your EQ game? Let's just do a quick little exercise. Put one hand on your chest and do an equalise. Just do it right now. Did your chest move when you equalised? If it did, bad news, friend. You are using Valsalva. You need to go to Ted Hardy's Roadmap to Frenzel course and learn how to frenzel. Now, quite often, if you've come from a scuba background, you will be using Valsalva. This is what you're taught. And uh, when you've got a tank on your back, it's pretty effective. But when you are head down, bum up in the world of free dive spearfishing, you need to learn frenzel technique. It will get you down and past 30 foot and equalizing with ease. To learn this frenzel technique, go to noobspiro.com forward slash Ted. Check out the Roadmap to Frenzel class. He will get you Frenzel equalizing within a matter of days. Check it out. It's a simple, easy to follow course. Noobspearer.com forward slash Ted. Jeremy Gamble from Spearing Magazine, the world's greatest spearfishing publication, says, anytime I hear anyone complaining about the ears, I always say the same thing. Talk to Ted. He's known throughout the industry as the guy that can fix people's struggling with clearing issues. There's no one out there that knows more about equalizing and teaching people to equalise than Ted. Check it out again at noobspiro.com forward slash Ted. Tough situations, guys. Scary stuff. Like, um, what are, what are kind of like, in UK waters where you guys are doing a lot of shore-based stuff or even with your boat diving, what are the kind of the three biggest risks? Um, sharks are, prob- are not an issue there, are they? Um, no sharks, no. no, not really to speak of. So what are the risks to your safety in, in your guys' eyes, like top three? 
Well, generally, I, try, I tend to try and stay away from Anthony because he seems to be the biggest risk when we're diving <laughs> together, as Ben will uh, grog, attest to me. Grog bog, I, I reckon. Too, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, no, nice. I mean, to be, to be honest, I, I, you know, we, we've been really lucky. Um, lucky or well-prepared. I don't really know which one to use, but um, we haven't really had that many scares, really, to be honest. Um, you know, maybe, you know, Back in the day when we were allowed to dive at night, I guess that's like the highest risk time to dive, I suppose. And I'd, you know, you I disagree to- and remind you of the speedboat at a point that we went that was very, very, very close to you. Oh well, yeah. Besides boats trying to run you over because no one in the UK understands any flag, um, they don't understand what the flag means, a dive flag. Um, because in the UK you don't need a boat license. Um, anyone can own a boat, anyone can drive a boat in the sea, it's just whatever. And, Hence the um, reason I've got one. <laughs> yeah. And and yeah, so with that comes the fact that nobody knows anything about how to actually drive a boat amongst anyone else. Mm. And um, yeah, we've we've had a few close calls with boats like nearly taken us out, and that's obviously why it's good to have uh, have a dive boy with you all the times really and that's something actually going back to the um bsa that's actually something that we're going to be pushing through the bsa this year mm-hmm. is a um a campaign to promote um well just to push out awareness of dive flags and what they are and what you should do and everything else isn't it Anthony? i had a, cu- a conversation a little while ago on the podcast about this because there's been a couple of campaigns run by the governing bodies in australia there was um look out look out diver about and then there's a picture of a diver beneath the flag and then it's kind of like yeah. done as a sticker that people can put on their vehicle and another one was mm-hmm. um oh, oh i can't remember what it is oh fl- flag, flag. flag plus float equals diver below Something like that, and yep. it's just and mm-hmm. then like, but they are both stickers and and good for sort of raising awareness. You put stickers on your car, and then hopefully someone goes, "Oh, that's what that's what the flag means," you know. <laughs> but we do have boat licensing here, but there is like in the in the ocean, there's that many flags and shit that people have to remember. Like, um, I, I just think it just it's off people's radar if they drive through the same patch of water fifteen times. Uh, you know, then then they come through, and then there's a flag. They're probably just a lot of people don't connect the dots. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but our, our jet skis tend to be the worst, our mm. worst enemy over in the UK, mm. uh, for whatever reason that is. Whether they just like to use our dive boys as a, a sort of mark to do their uh, their racing around, but yeah, they tend to be our worst enemy. I don't know about you guys over in Australia. Yeah, yep. Now we have the same sort of thing. A lot of um in Australia, a lot of the sort of the um. The, the the waterways like where you've got big large bodies like river systems and stuff where they enter the ocean there's there are no spearing zones partially mm-hmm. because of boat traffic Same, yeah. and just the heightened risk and um it's unfortunate because like for entry level spearos you know if, within that 20 meters of a rock wall can be really productive and easy ground to learn how to hunt um so it's a bit of a shame but i mean i can understand it from a from a boat traffic point of view and jet skis. Yeah, so yeah. further to what Richard was saying a second ago, as I've I had an email from Max um, that was forwarded. I believe the story goes that there was a Spiro in Oz or possibly New Zealand um, that was uh, killed by the props of a boat that had gone over the top of him, and there was a the his father was trying to advocate for uh, more boat safety and more knowledge around diver flags. And I'm pretty sure that was Australia. Um, and that's where the, uh, the the stickers or the branding lookout Spiro about mm. um, had come from. Mm. And so I've got all of the imagery for, for printing out those um, stickers and we're going to try and get them into, you know, at least all of the launches um, in the South Coast um, this year. But yeah, it, it's it's trying to spread awareness that jet skis and boating, the same as fishing, has been around for a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, spear fishing, especially in the UK, is with social media and especially YouTube, becoming faster and faster a much bigger sport. Um, and you, I, I'm still shocked at how many people that I personally sell cars to. And we're having conversation and I say, oh, yeah, no, I'm going spearfishing this weekend. And they're saying like, what? Yeah. Spearfishing? 
what you 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 throw spears at fish yeah. and i'm like no 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 it's it's way more crazy than that i go down with rubber bands and metal spears and i fling rubber bands at fish while holding my breath underneath 10 12 meters of water and they're like <laughs> nah you're insane and there's there's still you know even for the bsa last year there was 280 members of the BSA. And even if we were to 10 times that amount of Spearows that aren't part of that, that's still only a couple of thousand people that spearfish in the UK. So it's such a small sport, smaller than shooting, smaller than game hunting, smaller than anything else. So it's so niche that we the awareness of it does really need to be pushed and we're hopefully going to do that this year it's probably comparable to black powder hunting pheasants there in terms of size <laughs> when you say black powder do you mean 12 gauge no nah, no nah, they're the old guns like muzzle loaders where you know <laughs> yeah, yeah. single ball yeah <laughs> no i hear what you're saying it, it even though it's growing explosively over there it, it's still it's it's still obviously relatively small. I mean, spearfishing in general, it, it, you know, everyone thinks it's probably like you look on, you think it's mainstream here in Australia and New Zealand and maybe parts of the US as well, but it's definitely not. It's always a fringe thing. And it's, mm. it always attracts a very quirky and unusual bunch of people, which is why you guys started a podcast together. Absolutely. <laughs> um, and what what are your three things? Which would you what, Scary stories. No, yeah, or like concerns. Oh, oh yeah, like, so you um, had you had boat strikes. That's up there. Yeah, for me, it's like um, I've, there's been two occasions this year where I thought that I'd lost someone. So, like spirit <laughs> diving without floats is something that, um, especially on a shore dive, I just think that's just so dangerous. And I've been out a couple of times um, in those situations where I thought I'd lost the other the other guy. So I always carry on carry on a float, big or small or whatever. Um, one of the time we found them with a drone when I was just about to call the Coast Guard. <laughs> the other time, oh, I felt like ages. And I'd gone out with um, basically two randoms I'd met on Instagram. I, and they put a post out, anybody want to come spearfishing in Cornwall? It's like a couple of hours away. I was like, yeah, amazing, brilliant. And we got on this boat and um, they're really, really lovely guys. And, and they both got in the water. And then one of them basically just disappeared and I couldn't see him. And I, I shouted to his mate, I said, well, where's, where's he gone? I, I can't see him. And then th- this guy swam back to his boat, sat on top of the boat and still, we still couldn't find him. And we were both getting like pretty worried. Anyway, he'd just gone a little bit closer to the shore and his, his um, wetsuit kind of blended in with the cliff and and that was all that happened. But yeah, like losing someone out at sea, that that does give me the, the heebie-jeebies, but um Bright, bright oh, coloured floats, sealed, really. <laughs> bright coloured floats go a long way, don't they? With a big dive yeah, flag hanging off. Um, apart from serving as attractive devices for jet skis, I think they still do serve <laughs> a really important purpose for sure. Yeah. So boat strikes, losing divers, um, seals is, was the last one. They, seals. They, 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 they used to scare the shit out of us. Actually, we, we got used <laughs> to them in, in, in the end. But just yeah. the first time I saw one of these big bull seals in the water, that was with Anthony, wasn't it? I think. Um, mm. Yeah, we, we both basically shot ourselves and swam together and hugged in the water for about 10 minutes. <laughs> Lucky. <laughs> I, I, I had a seal like probably about 10 centimetres away from my face on a night dive once when you were allowed to night dive. Oh, that was a um, pretty uh, scary moment. But <laughs> other than the fact that I nearly like crap on wetsuit, nothing else happened. But you, For me, yeah. in, Lucky... in the first year, my, my scariest thing was my imagination. And... <laughs> again richard going back to the he conquered my fear of kelp but still um there was a couple of wrecks that i've dived and still although i would class myself as a water baby going down 14 16 meters in quite murky water and being met with the rusty 100 year old wreck that's covered in yeah rust and it's just like, oh my god, I'm going to get taken by Poseidon and <laughs> spoon-fed prawns under the sea for the rest of my life. It's just like, what's going to grab me? There's going to be a giant squid that's just going to eat me with his beak. <laughs> it's like, fuck that. <laughs> yeah, lucky none of you guys uh, named Bo. Otherwise, you'd have to get a sponsorship with some of these scary seals. <laughs> yeah. Um. Oh, good. Um. Funny stuff sounds like half of your scary stuff is just as funny. Um, 
being spoon fed prawns by Poseidon actually sounds like a like like a good activity compared to sounds all right to me. My day job, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I could deal with that. Um, funny stuff. Oh, yeah. oh my, my my funniest one from last year, which which cracked everything, was um. So they, I went diving this little cove, and it is a real small place, and so there's a coastal footpath that leads around it, and um, it was high tide, so there was no beach. Oh, I could have gone to there was a main beach but it was full of people so other than that it was um, nowhere else to climb up and do what I needed to do but anyway um, you know nature poo called and I had to go and it was it's one of those and um, you know I, I landed up having to just do what we call the uh, I think someone in your podcast actually referred to it the uh, the Cornish sea turtle <laughs> where uh, <laughs> I, I just had to try and get my wetsuit off as fast as possible and just bend over and go for it. And um, But it was literally in the view of the coastal footpath and everybody walking that coastal footpath could see what I was doing. <laughs> I mean, there was no getting away from it, but I had nowhere else to go. So it's just one Daddy, of those. But... <laughs> Daddy, why is that fountain brown? Daddy, yeah, what's Shrek was not... doing over there? <laughs> what kind of sea creature is that, Daddy? <laughs> Daddy, it was not. I good thought look. we were pale, but his bottom is shines like the sun. <laughs> that sun is the albino brown squirter turtle, also known as Richard Gomez. <laughs> the brown squirter turtle. Oh, there's a title for an episode right there. Yeah, I, yeah, it was not a good look, but what can you do? You know, these things happen in spearfishing. <laughs> good. They do, what about mate. you, lads? I was just actually, really? I, you reminded me of a story. I, I was heading up the Sunshine Coast, which is like an hour and a half north, and I went with a mate and we just decided to head down this sort of cliff, like this rough bush, bush path, um, and then sort of head out onto this sort of unexplored beach, so we thought, because um, we'd spotted a bit of like structure off the beach. It wasn't just all sand. <clears throat> anyway, we got there like 4.30 in the morning. Um, it was just getting light. We head out and we sort of, we went out and it was quite sandy in front of the beach where we, we got in front, so we... We swam around to the right, probably four or five hundred meters, and sort of speared around. We found some reef and stuff. Anyway, we come back like two or three hours later, and arrive back on a gay nudist beach. <laughs> and there's these two blokes there, and they're full full nude. And you know, there's no other place to come in though. Like our car was parked above it, so I'm just like, oh, you know, to go. How are you spelling? How are you spelling? Come in. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> there was yeah. <laughs> so we we get into the beach and awkwardly walk past these guys and back up to the car and I was like, we're never sparing there again. But I made the mistake <laughs> I made the mistake of telling one of my workmates and um it, it, ever since then it went through this whole workplace and they're like, he's a spiro. You, do, you, do you want to come spearing with me? And that was that was that kind of stuck with me for about a year. Like, oh, I'm a big spiro. And, you know, <laughs> so that was a that was an awkward moment for me. But yeah, thanks for reminding me of that story, Ben. What about you, brother? Oh, mate. Well, um, this year I've been pretty lucky. The lads will attest to that. And um, I've lost watches. GoPros, all sorts. And the funny thing is that I always find them. So I GoPro it completely fell off my head in the middle of the sea. Next morning, my wife pops down to the beach, picks it up off the beach and good as new, carry on for the rest of the season. Oh, that's Watch awesome. Watch I left somewhere and Anthony found it on the wall or something. Anyway, I went, went to... Um, Went down with the family to a really lovely beach. Um, really excited to go out spearing. The plan was to bring back some fish, and I brought the little stove and stuff so we could have a little cook up on the beach. Like ambitious, really excited. But anyway, so um, getting dressed, and I realised I didn't have a snorkel. Luckily, l- little Alex, who's well, he's, he's he's four at the moment, and um, he had this tiny, like, really thin bore snorkel that <laughs> kind of like li- went up to probably the top of my head from there. <laughs> So I thought, well, that could be funny. I'll, I'll give give that a go, um, and it kind of worked. But I, you could, I, 
snorkels are designed to um, be a specific diameter, mm. right? So that you, you're not hyperventilating or whatever. 28 so mils or something, to... isn't it? Is that right? Is that what it is? I, 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 I can't I, remember. I, I think but that sounds Anyway, right. it wasn't working very well because I could tell that I wasn't comfortable in the water. So I was breathing up on my back and trying to dive down. It yeah. was just, just a nightmare. Anyway, I, I found someone's... Um, so someone snorkel set like just in the sea. Oh, about, perfect! Like, to, to ten meters depth. <laughs> I just can't wait to tell the lads about this. They'll, they'll never believe it. <laughs> anyway, put, put, I mean, it was, it was bright pink, and yeah. um, put that on, and um, yeah, managed to get some fish and, and, and a lovely, uh, pink lovely meal. Man. Mask. Yeah. Oh, I, I, actually, I lost a mask, didn't I? As well, that was quite. Oh, funny. mate, I was just about to say, you got to tell him about the one <laughs> where me and yeah, you went well, out. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I was I don't know how I managed to lose it, but it, it fell into the sea anyway. And where where it was, the um the weed is like a foot thick, like it's this green, slimy, green, horrible weed. Snotty, thicky weed, yeah. I was like, never never gonna get that back. It's it's just not happening. So I, I fired around and the funny thing is I, I took off my weight belt and my um my jacket. So I tried to get in to go and go and get it. I was just like bob, bobbing around. Anyway, luckily, um I saw, oh, there's this house nearby. I'll just go and ask them if they have a snorkel because, like, everybody has a snorkel, right? And um, she came out, and it was, like, this full face mask. I don't know if you've seen them, but, like, literally the whole face. Yeah, and then the yeah. snorkel coming out the bottom underneath your chin and then coming up, and it was a huge snorkel, like, opposite bore, like, I don't know what it was, like, you know, six-inch bore kind of thing. <laughs> and, um, yes, yeah, so I had this full, uh, it's bright pink. I don't know what it is about finding pink snorkel or using pink snorkel. Anyway. Put put it all on and um, managed to find find the mask and and get on with my day. But I must have like such an idiot, kind of like bobbing around with this massive massive thing. I couldn't you know, couldn't equalize. It was filling up with water. It was that just would totally pointless. That would make such a good photo for Instagram though, like with holding a big polar oh, cup with that mask. I, on. That's that is my only regret from that day is not taking a photo to send to the lads. But um, my my yeah. regret of that day is leaving too early and not seeing all this happen. <laughs> <laughs> How you found that mask, I will never know, man. That was like yeah. thick, thick, thick weed. That's crazy. I'm so lucky. That's why so we call him Mr. Lucky. Mr. Lucky Dunford. <laughs> All right, fellas. Um, oh, earlier we were talking about wetsuits and thick wetsuits, and I mean, you were just talking about there about bobbing around. Um, Weight and weight ballast. How are you guys weighting yourselves these days? Like you, you've all kind of been spearing for a little while now. Like, what systems have you developed for? Because it's so hard to dive when you got a big thick wetsuit on and so much weight. Like, you know, like when I'm in the clean, warm water and I've been and I'm been diving for a couple of days and I'm getting some dive fitness back. I, I love going deep and spending a bit of time there. But when I'm in cold water, even if I'm coming from having good dive fitness and then going cold, it's really hard to dive at all. Um, and waiting and having a thick wetsuit on seems to be part of the problem. So how do you guys get around this? Yeah, I mean, I we don't know any, any better, right? We've never dived in warm waters. The, the only other place we've, that we've been is um, is the Isle of Skye in Scotland. But um, I've been to the way a lot of us... Oh, oh yeah, you did go to Tenerife. Oh, sorry, I, I was wrong. Um, but the way we a lot of us do it is with a, um, a dive vest and a dive belt. So I have, I don't know what, <clears> five or six kilograms on my belt and like one and a half to um on my top and that that seems to work quite nice it also helps with the duck dive a little bit it just makes it a little bit more natural because your weight spread out mm. and helps on the on the bottom as well the same same kind of reason but i don't think you use a, a, a dive vest do you Anthony? no so the, the way that i so when i again going back to when i first started um i went down spent a load of money on all the gear um but then as soon as I got in the water, I realized this same old adage of all the gear, no idea. So I immediately booked a course um, on free diving because I still feel that free diving is the initial part of all of the knowledge that is spearfishing. The hunting is the spearfishing, but everything else that we do is free diving. Um, and so I went with Emma Farrell um, over to Tenerife to Atlantis free diving uh, with Pavel and got on a week's course in Tenerife uh, in a brand new seven mil wetsuit 
in 26 degree water <laughs> and <laughs> i was also drinking the entire time because i'm a functioning alcoholic um and he just yeah roasted the entire time but for, uh, again not not to push well, i think we do quite a bit on our podcast but a course to teach you how to weight yourself in specific depths mm. so one of the things that i learned very quickly was that the way to weight yourself is to go out with whatever weight you feel is right or whatever you've learned from the youtubes um so i'm in a seven mil wetsuit i'm six foot six um weigh about 120 kilos i haven't got too much fat on me um so i'm quite you know i'm not necessarily buoyant um but i wear seven kilos on my belt in a seven mil wetsuit and the way that i found that was you go out into deep enough water um you put your weight belt on obviously you've got your suit you've got all your gear exhale completely and once you've exhaled completely the water shouldn't come up to your nose it should come just above your mouth if you sink take a kilo off see if you're surfacing if your head is fully above water you're underweighted mm. But again, it depends on the depths that you're diving. Mm. If I was diving in the depths of Australia, which I've never done, you know, 30 meters or 100 feet, um, I would probably underweight myself. So I'd probably take two or three kilos off, perfect my duck dive, because the duck dive gives you the, the force or the, the energy to get down past the positively buoyant stage. Mm. until you get down to neutrally buoyant and negatively buoyant mm. so for me it's i i do a lot of my spear fishing in, in eight to 14 meters and a lot of it is also shallower but i stay the same way um and just use your duck dive to propel you past the positively buoyant part but mm. overweighting you, yourself is dangerous so i'd always say go out the first thing you do is once you're in two or three meters of water exhale see if you're weighted correctly if yeah. not take a kilo off it can only help you perfect your duck dive yeah if you're like underweighted that. you just need to duck dive better that's really good advice and like you, you don't like you say like working to get down like with a good clean duck dive and some robust fin strokes to get down below below where you've got to stop working so hard to counter the positive buoyancy that's a good point you don't want to be working on your way up when you're at the end of your breath hold and yeah, stuff like that. Especially when you're towing a 15 pound or, well, in your state, 150 kilo fish. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where you get these ideas from. I'm hearing 30 meters and <laughs> 150 kilo fish. And I'm just like, like a lot of, like a lot of shore based stuff here. Like there's a lot of guys in Australia that, you know, spearfish seasonally and they have flat out 30 foot divers and, you know, it's the same range. There's a very small group of guys that dive um, beyond sort of 25, you know, 80 feet, uh, 25 meters, 80 feet. Um, and it's a very, it's a very niche, it's a niche within a niche, those guys. But most of us, we're just trying to catch a feed. And, um, you know, between 30 and 60 feet is a, lo a lot of people's sort of comfortable operating range, even in warm, clean water. But um, well, as, a, a, as an English Brit, I've always been one that's pushed the metric system. Yeah. And I don't understand why we have miles when kilometers are a thing, yet we measure everything in mil and centimeters. But whenever I'm watching YouTube, I still want to convert my meters dived to feet because it just sounds so much better. It does. <laughs> it does. I'm a 140-foot diver. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's only 35 meters. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a nice ring to it, isn't there? Um all right, guys, let's head out with um, a faster paced round of questions. Uh, are, you, are you good to go? We'll do a round table. I'll just go, we'll go Ben, Richard, Anthony, and we'll go around twice. How's that? Sounds, Sounds good. good. All right, Ben, what's the single best piece of advice you've ever been given for spearfishing? I'll just make some friends and maybe someone with a boat as well. I think uh, you can learn so much from experienced people, far more than you can on YouTube or anything else. So, yeah. All the new Spirit podcasts. All the new Spirit <laughs> <laughs> you, you can learn quite a lot on there, to be fair. Yeah, no, nah, it's all good. <laughs> um, Richard, uh, who has been the most influential person or people in your spearfishing? Uh, Dan Newman, to be honest. Um, not recent, well, only recently met him last year, but to be honest, he's been 
one of the, uh, the biggest influences for me for the last year. And last year is when I took it really serious, you know. So, yeah, shout out to Dan Newman. That's uh, that's my boy. Okay. Anthony, if you started all over again, what would you do differently? Uh, Christ. In all honesty, I, I don't think I would do anything differently at all. I've been ridiculously lucky um both in the initial financial position to be able to go to a shop and spend to get the decent gear and then a course um but the biggest thing for me was just again getting into a group of people that have already got the knowledge um and i don't want to say leeching but learning from them um and and yeah, I, I my my first year of spearfishing, I wouldn't change a thing. Mm. Sorry to not answer the question. Nah, that's good. It's I, good. I've, I've I've been yeah, I, I'm so thankful. Um, especially like Richard, shout out to his boyfriend. I'm going to shout out to my sugar daddy, um, <laughs> David Callahan. Even though he's a ex hairdresser <laughs> and. Uh, a massive bitch um he's he's not I, I love him to pieces he's been an inspiration in the sport that i've fallen in love with yeah. um and i couldn't have asked for for anything more that's fantastic it's good you've had a, a good first year so many stories that are not like that so that's good um ben what current challenges do you face in your spearing and how are you approaching them can't get out at the moment um, the the viz is so bad. We've had colds and ear infections and all those kind of things. When the viz has been a little bit better, I don't know. There's not much you can do about that, is it? You just got to roll with the punches and and kind of look forward to a better day. And uh, yeah, so I've, instead of um, actually spear fishing, I watch spear fishing videos, listen to the noob spearo, listen to the spear hangout, and um, you know keep the stoke going. Mm. Um. Richard, this question is directed at you, but it's possibly for all of you. Um, dream spearfishing destination. Do you guys have any aspirations, oh. ambitions to get out and do a big charter together? Are you coming, yeah, over, so, are you coming uh, over for Noob Spiro's big inaugural 20-spot <laughs> uh, uh, only coral reef trip? I am, and I wish, um, to, to be honest, uh, there's a few destinations we've got that we really want to get to and get to together especially. Uh, Norway being one of those. I mean, some of the videos you see coming out of Norway is just, yeah, it's, it's crazy. And um, we're, we're actually um, going to be talking to a couple of guys in Norway on our podcast soon. So we're sort of trying to gather that intel for everything together. But um, yeah, Norway looks incredible. Yeah, it really have you, does. Have you chatted with Axel? Yeah, we got Axel coming on this month. Um, Perfect. So we're going to be having a chat with him. Yeah, and yeah, he's, he seems like a really nice guy. And yep. there's a few of them that, that I mean, some of the content they, they push out from Norway just, yeah, it just keeps you, uh, keeps you, uh, as Ben says, keeps the froth going. Keeps the we, froth. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's great. We'll keep us I'm, I'm sorry. For you though, isn't it, mate? I was just about to say, he didn't even <laughs> say the Azores. Like, Richard, are you okay? We're always going on about it. <laughs> <laughs> the, the Azores is a close second. <laughs> yeah. Oh, is it? Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, those only, priorities only, have changed. It's only, well, no, mate. You know what? I, I love you, boys. So uh, a trip with you, boys, means more than oh. going by myself. So. Oh, have you guys seen um, David Ochoa's The Azores and One Breath? Yeah, yeah, it's um, it's oh, it's incredible. If uh, yeah, you gotta watch it. It was his. It was it. his first. It was his first attempt at a spearfishing documentary, and he crowdfunded it on Indiegogo. Um, Turbo and I got on it right when we were starting our podcast and absolutely just loved loved it. Like he's only gone from strength to strength with his filmmaking, but yeah, um, yeah. he really did a really bang up job covering the Azores. Um, some span fantastic spearfishing there for sure. Yeah. Amazing. Sounds amazing. How much yeah. does it cost and to I get there from the UK? Well, the Azores it doesn't cost much, but it's um it's the charters uh, that cost they're quite heavy, I think, because of fuel pricing. Um, but yeah, charts a day for four of you is about two and a half thousand euros. So, Jesus Christ! Yeah. yeah, it's not cheap. So, so is it? Is it? Where, where are the Azores? Are they Greek island? They're off Portugal. About, um, I think it's six hundred or seven hundred kilometers directly off Portugal. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, 
And um, yeah, the, the 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 charter does take you out to the Princess Alice Banks. I don't know if you've heard much about the Princess Alice Banks. No. It's meant to be one of the best pinnacles for spearfishing around. I mean, the um, Joe Joe when Joe came on Joe Pike came onto our podcast, he was talking about it, and um, him and uh, Mike Robertson. I don't know if you've heard of him. He's a prominent game chef in the UK. And they've got a um, an, uh, they got a new TV uh, channel which they've um, put together a TV show, sorry, and called Fishing the Wild. And they went out to the Azores and they went out to the Princess Alice Banks. And honestly, the footage is in- incredible. Yeah, well, wow. I mean, manta rays like all over the place, um, amber jacks. You know, I think Joe said what well, he had a forty kilo amber jack off yeah. there. Um, yeah, that's yeah, similar some- similar to David's footage by the sounds of it. Um, that's fairly cool. Is that available? Is that show available online? Fishing the Wild UK is it? Yeah, you can watch it online. So um, it's it's run through the outdoor TV uh, outdoor TV channel, okay. and um, yeah, they 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 do fish in the wild and farming in the wild. So there's a couple of shows on there. Cool. All right, last yeah. question. Uh, we I think it was Anthony hadn't had a second one yet. I'm I'm looking for a deeply meaningful answer here, Anthony. Could you describe? <laughs> What the spearfishing experience means to you in one sentence? I love one a, sentence. Yeah, I love I'm asking. To think about it. I love asking verbally verbose people to be succinct. <laughs> it's it's one to of my be favorites. sincere and non bullshit. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I'm. It, it, for people that know me, I'm one of the least eco warrior type bullshit people. However, and when I say eco bullshit, I also mean the yogic thing. I'm not a spiritual person. I don't believe in things. I'm a, I don't want to say a Scientologist, but I just believe in fact and looking after my own. When I'm spearfishing, it's just, it's the last year has given me access to a place I didn't know existed, mm. a, a, a peace and a calm and a focus that I've never experienced in my 34 years. And I, yeah, the the last 16 months has been the best part of my entire life. And not only because of the spearfishing, but because of the sport that I've had from my family Um, and the, the fun and the love that I've been able to give them from my own selfish sort of ways of wanting to try and get to a beach and get in the water and go fishing it's now making me drag kicking and screaming for a couple of the girls um my kids to the beach so that we can go out and that i can bring them the fish and i've been amazed by how even a a three-year-old girl is fascinated by the gills of a fish that their stepdad's just caught it's yeah just it, it's yeah taking me a back a bit and nice. uh made me realize that yeah i can take a bit of bullshit but it's also love yeah it's good i i think i think spearfishing too is like a bit of a selfish pursuit but it, it makes you better for everyone else so yeah definitely yeah. Man. <laughs> good one. That's how I judge. And, and, and unlike Richard and Ben, if you put fucking violins over any of the stuff that I said, <laughs> Isaac, I'm coming to Oz and I'm finding <laughs> I'm 100% going to do it. I'm actually just going to clip that bit out and just send it straight over to Ben. <laughs> And that, yeah, that's the that's the uh, that's that's the uh, Snapchat the that, short. That could be the promo, guys. Um, <laughs> Awesome to have you guys on the podcast. I 100% believe in the rising tide. I don't view um, the Spiro Hangout podcast as competition. I would love it if people go over and check it out. Um, you guys are also up on Instagram, the underscore Spiro underscore Hangout. Um, Anthony's on Instagram. Do you want your Instagram on here, Anthony? I am. So unfortunately, due to spearfishing, I had to renew my Instagram and Facebook. Again, hashtag drama. Um, I'm at Devon Autos New. D E V O N A U T O S N E W. Cool. And if people want a second hand car and they're in that area, they can come and see you as well. You'll you'll <laughs> sell them something that's running on three cylinders and tell them it's six. 
<laughs> yep, exactly. <laughs> That's most of the cars I sell. <laughs> I'm sure that it's not true. Um, ben, you're the Spiro Kitchen on Instagram. Mate, if people want to see fantastically plated up delicious dishes and some um, some cool sc- – are they screen grabs or are you using an underwater camera? bit of both. Uh, yeah, just screen grabs. Yeah, just um, GoPro. Okay. Yeah, nice. So Sp- the Spiro Kitchen on Instagram as well. Guys, fantastic. And um, Spiro, uh, this, this, the Spiro Hangout podcast, is that up on um, Spotify and Apple and all the other places? Yeah, everywhere you can get your podcasts. It's it's everywhere, really. And um, Shrek, we really appreciate it. uh, you getting us on. I mean, it all started with you, really. So, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we, we talk about you all the time and we love the show and we've I've listened to it since I started. And yeah, man, awesome cool. job. There's awesome. a bit of beef between men. The only thing I would say is, yeah, Rich, we do speak about it a lot. But I seem to remember you saying that when on our 20th podcast, we had more downloads than Shrek. Definitely. We definitely do. <laughs> We're coming for you, <laughs> all right, fif- Shrek. All We're 15 the of the Spiros in, in the UK are uh, tuning in. No, no, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a small lifestyle, but it's a, it's a, it attracts a very passionate group of people like you identified yeah, before, definitely. Anthony. And uh, yeah, like, it's, uh, there's a bunch of awesome reasons why we all do this thing. So awesome chatting yep. with you guys. And uh, I hope you get a bunch more downloads from this one. Yeah, I appreciate that, Mike. Thanks. Thank, you. Thank you very Thanks much for having us on. And we're definitely looking forward to uh, getting out and diving with you at some point in the next couple of years. I- I'm planning on – I'm honestly planning on running a um, a-, a charter and uh, like a 20-person one where we – with like four or five tenders off the back and going spearing all day with a bunch of legends. Just no no – no courses or anything, just a just a bunch of spiros from around the place. So, when I get that organised, I'll shoot you guys an invite and see if we can make something happen. Amazing, but, uh, please do. Okay. Um, are, you, are you guys working on anything um, in twenty twenty three? You wanted to let people know about, or are you just going to carry on just releasing a bunch of awesome episodes? Yeah, we've got a few um, a few guests lined up that we think um, we're going to be trying to get on and from you know diff- different parts of the world and you know guests are doing some stuff that's a bit different to what we normally play out there so uh, we're working on that we're working again season two out and um yeah we're just going to be pushing content out as much as we can and you know we we love it you know we love doing the podcast and as much as we love going spearfishing really because you know it is what it is but yeah that's it. i was going to say one of the next guests that we're still trying to hook up with the time difference between us and the us is somebody that shoots the fish that is attached to sharks Cobia. or at least follows sharks my mate, yeah, shot, sh- my mate shot one the other day we went out fishing and sorry we were wrapping the podcast up and here i'm telling <laughs> another story we we're out and my mate shot a kobe off the bottom i'll actually i'll put the footage in the show notes for this episode so people can see it because he sent me the video he shoots this kobe underneath a bull shark and then the shark just annihilates the kobe we caught no fish <laughs> just we just saw sharks all day long i uh, i posted so- when, when, you... when Rich said about um, the, the guy that we're getting on the podcast, I hadn't watched or known of any of his videos. Oh, yeah. And so, like, the, the next two nights, I spent the best part of, like, 12 hours watching all of his videos. Yeah. And the guy is, excuse my French, fucking insane. Yeah, yeah. Like, the, the amount of sharks in those waters. Mm. I mean, I'm a big bloke, and I don't, well, other than the fear of, you know, spiders and kelp. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I, I'm fine for a fight, but there's a hundred sharks that are going for it. You're insane. You yeah. you, you shouldn't be allowed in a boat. <laughs> All good, boys. Well, lots of stuff to look forward to this year. So, um, again, thanks for coming on. And, um, yeah, let's catch up again in the future. Cheers, Cheers Shrek. Appreciate See that, Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that interview. Uh, the Spiro Hangout Boys, what a bunch of legends. Richard, Ben and Anthony, gentlemen and funny, funny men. I thoroughly enjoyed it and um, I think this podcast that we've done is going live on their podcast as well. So go and listen to a couple of episodes. Find a few neat ones and have a listen. I'd encourage you to. Um, next week. Next week is a cool podcast it's a 10 person podcast it's one of those live ones that i did right in the middle of that um long weekend spearfishing and freediving course that i talked about 
Kieran, the other instructor and I, and as well as eight of our crew, get on and sort of share what happened in the weekend. And um, yeah, it's one of those cool, it captures that live campfire feel with a few brews as well. And I possibly had three or four at least. So come back and tune in next week. If you love the show, go to patreon.com forward slash noobspiro. Consider jumping on there and supporting the show on an episode by episode basis. There's 50 other legends putting fuel in the Noob Spirit outboard. I love it. Um, guys, reviews are always welcome. Otherwise, see you next week for the inaugural Long Weekend Spearfishing and Freediving Course Podcast. Boom. Today's episode was an absolute banger, and so is our major sponsor, Adreno. Visit them at adreno.com.au. They have a huge range of equipment. You can find it at adreno.com.au. Use the code NoobSpear at checkout. When you shop online, you can save $20 on every purchase over $200. You can even use that code in store at some of their huge mega stores Australia wide. Price be guarantee on any Australian spearfishing equipment price. Again, visit them at adreno.com.au. Use the code NoobSpear. I don't know if I'm allowed to say it, but oorah! When I say the words neptonics.com, I automatically want to say it. It is solid gear that works. It's the very best of spearing equipment and components from around the planet. Visit neptonics.com. It's solid gear that works. Visit neptonics.com. Use the code noob10 to save 10% off. Mm-hmm.